Uh, Trustee Barnes, are you are you on? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Uh, Trustee Wood, are you on? I am here. I am here. Thank you. Trustee Howard. Present. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Trustee McKenzie. Present. And uh, the chair is also here. We have the Pledge of Allegiance on our agenda. Not sure how that would work today. You want to try it? All right. Can you people see the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. all right. Thanks, everybody. That's a good attempt. All right. We have a chance to review the minutes. I hope everybody's had an opportunity to look at those. Does anybody have any additions, deletions, corrections, any, any comments on the minutes? All right, I'm, I'm hearing none. I will accept the minutes as they are. Public comment. We have one individual that has signed up for public comment. Uh, Mr. Brazil, are you on, sir? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir, we can. You have you have a couple minutes, sir. Okay, thank you. Hello, board members, and thank you for letting me make a brief comment today. My name is Tom Brazil, <clears throat> and I am a current student at NIC and have lived in Coeur d'Alene for 20 years. To begin, Embry was a great experience at North Idaho College. <laughs> The 40 hour work weeks throughout the summer included learning various scientific concepts and being exposed to the world of complicated scientific publications and ideas. The program allowed me to study and present on gene mutations that affect mitochondria within the retina of mouse models, and it really was an amazing opportunity. Unfortunately, the newly instituted COVID rules, such as masking, threw a wrench into the enjoyment and full participation of the program. This included not being able to go to the usual Embry conference or attend more in-depth labs at the University of Idaho, both which have been norm, the norm in the years past. I wanna thank many of the science and math faculty that gave ample amounts of their time and expertise to help us in our educational and professional development despite these setbacks. Unfortunately, these setbacks brought along with them an attitude that stifled academic and scientific inquiry. For example, I had voiced simple questions about the new mask rules, and this ended up with me having a long and awkward phone conversation with Tim Gerlitz, where he was not very thrilled that I was asking such questions. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, criticism of individuals and, and programs is not appropriate when we're having public comment on a celebrating success item. Mr. Brazil, can you circle around that? Can I what? Can you, sorry, the mask, probably hard to hear me, sorry. Can you um, circle around that at this point? I'm almost finished. Well, your comments should be not, should not be critical of uh, individual uh, employees or NIC students, certainly. So if you have an issue with a, with a individual employee of the college, then you should make that, that um, the issue known to a, the appropriate administrator outside of a public meeting. Okay, yeah, my main goal was just to extol my good time during the Embry program, yet highlight a few of the issues. So we can, if you wanna scratch the name, I'm fine doing that. 
I don't name anybody else and I only have a few more lines to read. Uh, complete your lines, but make them appropriate. Yeah. So I ended with that. I had the phone conversation that didn't go very well. Um, so to continue on science coursework at North Idaho College and Embry have taught me to have a skeptical stance toward generalized truth claims and to seek out empirical evidence. This is one reason the scientific community has such a high view of peer reviewed studies and literature. One of my questions was why we aren't able, why we were able to eat and talk to each other during the beginning of our Embry meetings, yet when a professor got up to teach and we all remained silent, that is when we had to don our masks. So this unscientific approach seems to be rooted in the fact that policymakers at the school don't actually consult the science faculty that have their very offices in the Meyer Health and Science building. I would encourage NIC administrators to utilize the science faculty that they have on staff, which would help foster a more cohesive and better thought out plan towards public health issues, both now and in the future. I'll end by mentioning this isn't the first time I have experienced pushback in regards to academic freedom, but I do hope it will be the last. Thank you for your time. Why don't we go ahead and continue? Uh, Dr. Burns, are you um, prepared for your presentation? Yes, I am. Uh, Chair Banducci, Thank members of the ahead. board. Um, it is my pleasure to be able to introduce Renee Cooper and Paula Lambert, two of our fine professors here at North Idaho College, who will be presenting this evening on the Embry program that was just um, introduced by um, our student, Tom Brazil. Um, I look forward to them sharing with you this unique and very important opportunity that is offered to community college students to engage in research. Um, North Idaho College, I will say from my perspective, does it um, as well, if not better than any community college in the nation. And, and our college has received accolades from across the country for the program that we have um, instituted and provided here in collaboration with the University of Idaho who, who um, runs the grant for us. So I don't wanna take away all of their information and thunder on, on this particular program, but um, I look forward to hearing them share the success of our students uh, who have engaged in this program. Dr. Need to Burns. ask a quick, oh, sorry. Do we have any handouts on this or anything by chance? Or, or? Um, I'll let Paula speak to that. I know that she wanted to provide uh, some information to the Board of Trustees, but because we have board members in a variety of spots this evening, I think she was going to make sure that Shannon had um, those materials and they will be shared out with the members of the board. All right, all right so thank you. We have a um, PowerPoint that we will be presenting to you and we can make that available to you after the presentation. Okay. And there is sitting in front of both of you, a, a Embry gift. There's um, some factual information in there about Embry and there's an Embry t-shirt in there that we hope that you will wear with pride as you um, walk around helping us promote what we do in Inbury here at NIC. I'm gonna turn the time over to Renee. She's going to do the majority of the presentation here. And then um, we, I will step back in in just a minute. Dr. Burns, thank you for that very gracious introduction. And uh, Paula and I are both very excited to be before you all of you because we love Embry and love talking about Embry. So I'm going to hit my shared screen button. So we're here tonight, we're talking about all things Embry and we call them high impact practices. And we've done some uh, data crunching and know what it, the effects it has on our degree completion rates uh, and have some comparisons to look at those because everybody wants to talk about degree completion. So first of all, we have to back up and look at a little bit of what Embry is. You know, it's one of those government acronyms. It's actually a federal grant that comes from the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, and the I-N-B-R-E, the I is IDEA, an Institutional Development Award. So we have an acronym inside the acronym. The N is network, 
of B Biomedical R Research Excellence. So INBRE, I-N-B-R-E. So at NIC, the Natural Sciences is the home of the Embry Award. There's about 13,000 students that run through our classes every year. We have 17 full-time faculty, and typically our students are a little bit geographically bound. They love Idaho. They love Coeur d'Alene. They really want to stay here, and it's because of that that we developed some of our pieces of our program the way that we did. We have three different high impact practices, three different ways to enter the Embry pipeline. We have scholars, which is designed for freshmen. It's about a two week type of program. We have industry interns that can spend the whole summer with industry and while they're still at home. And then we also have fellow, fellows that we put with uh, research professors. Our, note, our totals are pretty good. These are our totals since 2003. Uh, another faculty was laughing at me the other day as we were going down the list and I was telling everybody where everybody was and who had babies and who didn't have babies. So that was kind of fun. These are some of the industry partner places that we worked with. I would like to highlight the first three people that also took a chance on us at NIC. Kimber Gates at Coeur d'Alene Cellars was one of the first to take a chance on us. Nikki Turner Reeds at the Micro Lab at Kootenai Health was one of the first, and Walter Mueller at Accurate Testing Labs in Coeur d'Alene. Those were our anchoring, our three that said, yes, we love students. Yes, we will take some students. And then over the years, we've kind of grown depending upon the various needs. Here's what our graph looks like in bright and shiny colors. Uh, this one actually just has from 2003 to 2018 numbers on it. As you'll notice, those top numbers that got to about 20, well, Renee almost had a nervous breakdown those summers. So we kind of backed up and said, okay, let's look at the quality of also what we're doing. And of course, just some years, our cohort is larger than other years, but we did find that we kind of had a, a, a top limit. We had a ceiling on how many students uh, that we were able to, to work with. And so what, you know, there's a lot of work, it's a lot of grant money and, at some point we said, does it work? Does it help students? So that got us to looking at our various completion rates. And um, the first thing that we decided is comparing our Embry students to the general NIC population was not a fair comparison. It's a totally different kind of cohort. So we selected organic chemistry to compare ourselves to. And of course, organic chemistry is a gateway class you can talk to anybody that's taken it and they will groan <laughs> and talk about the rigor of the organic chemistry. You know, if you get through organic, you're going to get through anything. So we thought that was a little bit better comparison of how well this extra grant money was helping out our students. And we're really, really proud of that 96% completion rate. I was one time asked why it's not 100%. Uh, <laughs> which I think is unrealistic, but also we take a chance on some students. Those students that we think, you know, we think they have potential, they just haven't been given a chance and we'll take a chance. It's not just the cream of the crop students that we're always choosing. We see somebody that's either got an interest or a spark or there's fire in their belly or a twinkle in their eye and we'll, we'll take a chance on those particular students. We did look at and separate out the OCHEM students with Embry support and the ones without Embry support. And then we looked at up to the associate's degree, the bachelor's and the post -bac degree. And you'll see that the numbers are not drastically different till you get to the no degree category. And with that, the Embry support has seemed to make a huge difference there. Uh, statistically, I think in the other degree categories, it's, it's not that drastically different, but that student that might have fallen through the cracks, I think the Embry support has allowed us to keep a hold of those. We also broke it down. Did it matter if the high end pra practice was a scholar, an intern, or a fellow? And once again, I'm going to say those numbers are pretty tight. Uh, there's not a drastic difference in which type of high impact practice those students had. Uh, we also now, because of the Embry program, we have biomedic 
bioinformatic research on campus, we've gone from what we used to say, oh, we just want to have research awareness, and now we actually have research opportunities. Uh, we have research on our campus. We say it's in the closet because it's a little room behind the computer lab, uh, but it's a three-way kind of collaboration. Uh, NIC, Dr. Long at Lewis Clark State College, and Dr. Peter First at the University of Idaho. Uh, typically, it's two or three students a year and at least one faculty that's in this bioinformatics research. But because of that and because of the connections, that has led to the next slide. And I'm going to turn this one over to Paula because she's been involved with it on a more intimate level than I have. Paula? So thank you, Renee. We have been working with uh, Dr. Peter First at the University of Idaho on a Bridges to Baccalaureate grant that he has submitted to the NIH. And it would allow us to bring to University of Idaho students the opportunity to complete most of their degree in Coeur d'Alene and attending NIC for a good portion of the classes that they would need to take in that. Um, it'll be two plus years at NIC and then a combination of classes between the University of Idaho at the Coeur d'Alene Harbor Center and courses that we can offer at NIC as well. And then a fourth year down um, in Moscow or a split between Coeur d'Alene and Moscow. I don't know if we've completely figured out how we'll offer those last courses, but that brings a medical science degree to Coeur d'Alene students and to our Coeur d'Alene community when we have these um, community bound or place bound students that really don't have the opportunity to go down to Moscow for four years of their education. It's allowed us to work on a pathway that would allow them to complete the majority of their schooling in Coeur d'Alene so they could stay at home um, or in our local community and then complete the rest of their degree um, through the University of Idaho and maybe only have to travel down there for one year but we've also been looking at opportunities of collaborating between our faculty and the University of Idaho faculty and trying to bridge even that fourth year and see how we might be able to offer some of the courses online or look at lab space that could be um, used in collaboration with faculty at both institutions. So this is a really exciting um, piece that has come out of part of the Inbury, um contacts that we made because Dr. Peter first reached out to us and knew us because of the Embry research that we had been doing with him at our institution. So this bridges to baccalaureate. Um, although it's a grant, it has been submitted. We haven't heard yet. I do believe that we will continue to work on this even if we don't receive the grant because we do know that this is a very important way for our students to be able to move on to a four-year degree and still be able to um, stay in our local community. One of the other things that is very interesting about this Bridges to Baccalaureate program is that we would be able to work directly with students to provide research opportunities that we don't currently offer at NIC. So we would be pairing University of Idaho students with North Idaho College students as mentors and then as they continued on in their degrees and working on research at the University of Idaho, they would come back to NIC and be the ones that are mentoring our students as they move forward in this four-year degree. So we're very excited about the possibilities that this might um, give to our local community and um, to both institutions to work collaboratively and make this possible for um, science students. We're very um, and, and, and in particular, the medical science, where we are looking at these students probably moving on to medical degrees and into the WAMI program, um, which is a, another consortium program for medical school and for our students to be able to move into these programs that normally are not um, things that our students maybe think about because they are place bound at this time. So I'm I'm really excited about the next part of this presentation. I'm gonna turn it back over to Renee. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. So out of all the different students, we have three that have been highlighted so far out of the U of I 
Embry office in a program called I Am Idaho Embry. And I picked three that I just want to talk about a little bit. Michael Camerino, he was with that bioinformatics group doing research in the closet. Uh, he is a first generation college student. Uh, that means he's the first one in his family to go on to college. Uh, he was born and raised in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, so uh, was also one of those that, you know, uh, even though he was a very mature and very brave, sometimes I, we got to get you down to U of I. We got to get you down to U of I. Uh, so, but very proud of him in his uh, graduate research work that he's doing. So just, uh, he worked at Best Buy the whole time he was at NIC. Uh, so he was working full time. They had some kind of program that helped you pay for college. And we were really, really lucky because when we started the bioinformatics, we have these gigantic computers that I don't even know how to talk about. And we said, oh, no, we, Michael can put it together for us. And so and and he did. Uh, Catherine Brands is one of my all time favorites. She's an Embry poster child. She was a scholar. She was an intern. She was a fellow. Uh, she came to NIC in her first class she took at NIC was my microbiology class, not necessarily the recommended route to go, uh, but did great here, transferred to U of I, did her research there, and she's now back at the National Institutes of Health. So she has come full circle and she works with AIDS uh, and the, the cancer virus research program, which is very near and dear to Catherine's heart because her mother did die of breast cancer when she was an adolescent. And just look at the joy in that student's face. She just radiates joy and talent. And this person is a rock star. This is Melissa Clemens. She's one of our adjunct professors, even though she's a graduate student at the U of I. She started at NIC, uh, transferred to the U of I. She's a mom of four. She travels that road between Coeur d'Alene and Moscow quite well. I think she's probably gone through three cars. <laughs> Not sure exactly how many cars that she's gone through. So, but uh, she is a key piece in with the bioinformatics and I know will be a key player on the bridges to baccalaureate, but just a rock star, a student that you just can't, uh, nothing's going to stumble her. It's just, she will figure out. She does have days she goes, hmm, but she picks it up and, and she comes back in really well. And I could talk about hundreds of more of these, but those are three in particular that I wanted to highlight. And um, that's it for our presentation. And Paula and I thank you. And I uh, would be glad to entertain any questions that you might have. Or uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? Mr. Chair. Certainly, Ken, yes, please. I, I guess my only comment is um, I sit here um, not really understanding what I was about to hear when you started and ended up being so very, very, very impressed with all the work that you've done and the programs that are put together and are being put together. Um, you, you, are, um, you make NIC proud. So thank you very much. And your program makes us all proud. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's kind. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? If 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 there aren't any, I, I actually have a couple questions. I'm, I'm quite fascinated by this, and you probably saw me making notes. So first off, um, I, I do thank you for the handout. I do have one, and I thought this was very interesting to glance at. It looks to me like Embry is at a, a number of uh, educational institutions here in this state. Uh, looks like pretty much covering all the two and four year universities. Are, are each of these groups at each of these colleges, are they kind of independent and separate or are, they, are all you somehow linked in some way? So in the grant, so the grant actually comes into the University of Idaho and U of I graciously subs awards to every institute of higher ed in the state and each school has been given rain. Carolyn Bohosh has been very, very good at, they can each develop programs that best fit the mission of their institution. And as you know, the mission of each of these schools is different across the state of Idaho. And there's several Embry states in the United States and they, not, they haven't all done it that way. Some of them have kept all the money at their home institution 
And U of I was very gracious and really worked at building a network within the state of Idaho. Does and that I would like question? to um, oh. actually what? acknowledge that Carolyn is on, on this <laughs> call with us. She can't speak, but she can wave, Carolyn, and, and show them that <laughs> you are actually yeah. here with us and participating in this presentation. Well, it's interesting you're pointing out folks because you pointed out the three uh, folks you wanted to highlight. And I could have swore I recently saw Catherine speaking or presenting or something here through the school. Um, did I see that right? And then Nick now or something, she was part of maybe the month that we're celebrating the women that was, did you guys do a presentation or something with Embry? Was she speaking? No, or teaching? no. Okay. No, I Catherine's just a popular name. <laughs> okay. Now you use the word fellowship. How does fellowship differ from scholarship? And, and you talked about the types of help. Is it a financial help? Or are they getting a special type of counseling or a mentor or, or you know, what, guiding them through the program? Because you have a tremendous success rate. And from my experience and having had a couple of sons go through college and just knowing young people, maybe older people in college too, a lot of that, a lot of contact helps or a lot of, the more contact, the better, I think. So how, tell me about how you're helping them and, and the, the forms that that takes. So you might think of it as a learn and earn because they are paid an hourly wages out of the Embry grant. But we also have weekly meetings where we talk about how things are going, how to approach the research. We do a lot of professional development. I teach how to shake hands, how to dress, how to develop a poster, uh, how to make it. Oh, you're interested in this. I know somebody over here. Uh, so we really try to not only develop the scientific mind, but we try to weave in a lot of professional development with that. And we prepare them to present their research mm -hmm. at the, the conference that um, Tom Brazil was talking about earlier. Our students go down and present, and I, uh, sorry, Carolyn, I really think our students do the best out of all <laughs> the students when they present, because we grill them before they get down there, and we make sure that they are presenting their research in a very professional and um, scientific way so that they can answer the questions that people are asking them about their research. That makes sense. Well, at some point, they're going to have a thesis or doctorate, master's, whatever. They're going to have to support that and go in front of their, their um, mm -hmm. the board. I don't know. I can't remember what, you, what the right term for that is now. But I had five professors I had to go in and, mm -hmm. and uh, present my findings for the last 19 months. and. A 270 page document as to what I thought I had done and why they should give me a hopefully a good grade for it. So, um, <laughs> Your defending, experience defending. is spot on. <laughs> uh, the word fellowship, what does that mean, if I may? Is there something unique to that? Yeah. So the fellowship word means that we have paired them with a faculty researcher. And for our students, most of the time, that is somebody through the U of I. It may be somebody that works up here part-time in the summer at the Harbor Center uh, with the U of I Coeur d'Alene Center. It may be that the student is back and forth. Zoom has become an easy vehicle to do that. But the word fellowship is the premier piece of that. And it means they're actually with a research scientist. We started the industry program in Coeur d'Alene because I was finding that our students weren't quite ready. So, but they needed time at the bench. They needed some learning space. And so we started the industry internships and, uh, and that is often a stepping stone. Scholars is a two week introductory uh, experience. And sometimes that's exactly where that student is and that works really well for them. So it kind of increases in intensity. Starts with scholars designed for freshmen two weeks Industry interns is a full all summer type of program, but they're in a working environment as opposed to a research environment. Uh, but they also get exposed to the business side of things, a lot of quality assurance, quality control. They learn uh, different instrumentations. They have, say, time to develop their tie trading skills, et cetera. And then at the fellowship piece of that, there's a true research question where they're contributing to the greater body of knowledge. All right, Renee, I've, I've taken a lot of time. I'm gonna ask a couple of questions really fast. Give me the Reader's Digest version. Okay. The one is, the research we're talking about, is that being done at the Meyer Health Center? 
the bioinformatics team. research is at the in the Meyer Health and Sciences Center. And I really have to protect that space. Everybody wants my space. <laughs> well, it's not well, much. Well, we're building more space there. I know, I know. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. I could kiss you. <laughs> well, honestly, I'm quite excited about it too. It, it's I, I think this is a, a great investment. Um, this one again, go go with a quick answer. It says a $17.1 million grant program. Is that an annual renewable grant where they're getting 17.1 every year? Is that the cumulative from 2003 on? I mean, how long has this program been around? How many years? It's been here since 2001, and that's the dollar number every five years. Okay, hey. thank you. And that's a renewable grant. Will that keep going yes. for the foreseeable future? As long as Carolyn Bohart keeps writing a, group, a good renewal. <laughs> Carolyn okay. actually has access to speak if you'd like to ask her about that, particularly yeah, yeah. board member Banducci. I may not go any further just for time tonight, okay. but maybe offline. You know, I'm curious, but we have a lot of amazing grant writers here too. So I appreciate mm -hmm. the skill set and you're obviously doing a great job, Carolyn. Uh, this is kind of an aside question. We're partnering with the four year institutions, which is great. So I want them not to listen for just a second. Are we allowed, if we ever were able to self-contain, can we actually offer a four-year degree here or something like this, if we ever had the faculty and the staff and the facilities, not that that's where we're headed. Is there anything that prevents us from doing that? I think that's it written into the state constitution. That's why I'm asking, I'm not sure what that says. So I was just curious. So, Lita, do you know, what, what can we, can we ever do that if we wanted to? Because I heard rumor that maybe Spokane, their community college might be doing some baccalaureate work. Chair Banducci, uh, yes, there is a provision in the statute that does allow for very specific baccalaureate degrees to be offered at community colleges. Um, NIC is quite interested in being able to offer some applied science degrees, baccalaureate, uh, baccalaureate applied science degrees here. Um, we certainly do not want to get in, uh, in a competition with um, our four-year institutions, our universities, um, in offering those degrees, but there certainly are a number of applied baccalaureate degrees that we uh, would serve this community extremely well, and we are pursuing those under leadership of Dr. McLennan. Thank you. Yeah, and I wasn't to imply that we would compete. That was just a, mm -hmm. a segue question, just kind of curious if there were other areas where that might make sense if we had that capability or if we were allowed to. Are there any other questions for Paula and, and Renee? If not, ladies, thank you very much. That uh, was very enlightening. And you guys are doing a great work. So thank you very much. Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you for the opportunity to share what we do. Have a good evening. All right. The next uh, item on our agenda are the constituent reports. The first one up is uh, ASNIC, and it's Kai Settlemeyer. Kai, are you ready? Yeah. Hi. Can everyone hear me OK? Wait. I can. Awesome, thank you. Um, I will make my report quick. Um, so the past month, ASNIC has been very active. Um, one of our more exciting projects is actually very, very close to completion. We will be getting um, lights installed on the beach volleyball court so students can continue to play when it gets dark. They will turn off automatically at 10 p.m. But, you know, our campus is so beautiful. We want to really encourage people to use the space as much as possible. So we're very excited now that the weather is better to be able to get those installed. So be on the lookout for that. Um, we have also been working on um, the navigation on campus, as I have mentioned, for the past few months. And we are actually very close to getting map holders installed in every building on campus. So people will be able to navigate fairly easily. We're also looking into some directories for buildings such as Siebert and the Student Union Building and Boswell to name a few to make sure everyone knows where all of the services are because it is very important to make sure that they know what's available to them. Um, the as an sponsored student events board has also been very active. They recently did some plant take home kits that were very popular. And this past weekend, there was also the Cardinal Nest Fest, which was an online music festival live streamed on our Facebook page. 
it was very well attended and it was a really nice way for students to be able to engage online and turn their brains off for a little bit. So that's very exciting. I believe one of the next events that they have coming up in April is a drive-in movie. So keep an eye out for that. We've also been working on um, professional development classes and really evaluating ourselves and the services that we are providing. We feel that it's important to keep ourselves accountable and make sure that we're actually doing what we're promising that we're doing. So we are asking ourselves how we feel about our goals and if we've actually reached them and taking a deeper look into what we can do to improve. And to finish it off, I'm trying to not take too much time. Um, we have also had a senator who has been working to create a more refined list of all of the college standing committees here at NIC. So ASNIC officers and other students know what we have, what the purposes are, and how they can get involved. And finally, the thing that I'm the most excited about, our Declaration of Candidacy for ASNIC elections ends this Friday. And by next month's meeting, I will be introducing you to the person who will be taking my place. I am sad to be going, but I'm very excited to see who we get. So if you know of any students who might be interested, they have until I believe 2 p.m. on Friday. So let them know to reach out and apply. And that is about what I have. Thank you. Are there any questions board or Kai? I have a question. Trustee McKenzie, please. Uh, the December 16th meeting, you mentioned that the public is welcome to attend the ASNIC meeting. Is that, how would they go about doing that? That is a great question. So um, we have our monthly board meetings and we just had one yesterday. We will have the next one, I believe on, I wanna say April 24th, but I could be wrong about that, but we will have one next month. And we try to post the link publicly on our um, nic.edu slash ASNIC webpage. But if anyone is unable to find that, they are more than welcome to reach out and we will provide the link to them. Excellent, thank you very much. Are there any other questions for Kai? Kai, real quick, you got a couple more days. Have you been getting a good response for folks wanting to run for ASNIC? Um, I believe so, yes. I am very excited to see who we get. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much for your report. Next up is Faculty Assembly, uh, Chris Pelchap. Thank you, Chair Banducci, members of the board, President McLennan. Uh, at our March Assembly meeting, uh, we started off with uh, reports from our uh, Senate and the report for myself. Uh, my report to faculty assembly was mostly uh, housekeeping things as we wind down the year. There's a couple things we have to do as assembly to make sure we're set up for the following year. Um, those things are uh, establishing committee commitments from faculty for the 21 22 uh, academic year. Uh, so I sent out a survey for that, and everybody puts in their top favorite. Uh, as far as service to the college. And then I help kind of navigate getting everybody into the appropriate spots. We also have a handful of committees that are responsible for providing an annual report to the faculty assembly. Uh, so I reminded all of the, the key um, committee members of those reports. And so they'll be doing those in April and May. We also have the election of officers for faculty assembly um, that we have to have voted on and approved by May. And um, so I talked to them about what that process is like as a reminder. Uh, then we moved into old business. Uh, under old business, we got an advising update about the efforts that we're working on right now to uh, better integrate advising on campus. Uh, we also had an update from the FYE task force um, topic area of learning communities. Um, they had, they had presented the month before, but uh, they wanted to bring back some additional uh, pieces of conversation to keep it in front of faculty's minds. Uh, and we also got uh, some information about uh, the way in which the faculty are gonna engage with uh, commencement this year. Uh, we did a really fun video 
uh, presentation last year. And so we're gonna do something hopefully equally as clever. We will see how that turns out. Uh, and we moved into new business. And another one of the subgroups of the first year experiences task force presented to the faculty about new student seminars uh, that we're looking to uh, get off the ground in the fall and uh, soliciting some commitments to participate in that program. We also had a short conversation about some concerns about the bookstore. Um, there's some general faculty concern that's I think across the board just about getting the resources to students on time. Um, and that, that conversation is, con is going to continue into the April assembly meeting. Um, this year when we updated the constitution and bylaws, we added a um, adjunct of, uh, representative to the executive committee of assembly. And that person is Dr. Nicole King. And one of the things that she uh, started this year is she put together a survey to be sent out to adjunct faculty about the experiences they've had um, working in part-time as an instructor at NIC. Um, and we're hoping to get some good information from that survey. And um, hopefully I'll be able to present uh, those findings to you um, maybe in May. Um, we also had a short conversation about First Amendment rights, and that was towards the end of the faculty assembly. So that conversation is also being um, extended into the April uh, assembly meeting. And then we opened up uh, the meeting to uh, remarks for good of the order and uh, closed the meeting after that. Any questions? Board, are there any questions for Chris? I asked the same question. Is the faculty assembly, is, is it open to the public at large to um, like in person or on Zoom to listen? No, in our bylaws, the, the faculty assembly is a closed, closed session. So people have to be um, invited. So if somebody wants, potentially wants to attend, um, they can ask to uh, be invited either through um, a member of the executive committee or the chair. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Chris? All right. I don't hear any. Chris, thank you very much for your report. Uh, next on the agenda is the staff assembly, uh, Jeff Davis. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, Chair Banducci, trustees, President McLennan, President's cabinet, colleagues, and guests. Um, our last meeting was uh, wonderfully efficient. And um, besides the usual housekeeping, including new employee introductions, uh, we had our sterling silver award winner for the month, Terry Cruz, who is the coordinator of the Qualified Workers Retraining Program. And it was, it was quite lovely. We always surprise them and it's, it's always a great time. Uh, shout outs, which just to familiarize folks, shout outs are, are basically uh, compliments submitted to the staff assembly so that they can be read aloud and honor people who are doing outstanding work at North Idaho College. Uh, one of which was Laura Rumpler. Um, she has emerged as a rock star at North Idaho College. She informs us daily uh, and sometimes more than once a day uh, about uh, COVID vaccination opportunities for employees. And she has been just wonderful and transparent in letting us know what opportunities are available for the staff and faculty and employees of North Idaho College. Uh, the Senate report dutifully re recorded by Steve Kurtz as well as President's Advisory Council by Sarah Martin. Typically, we do try to have a guest speaker or somebody who we spotlight to give us more information that the staff would enjoy having. Um, 
this last uh, meeting, we had Alex Harris, who has assumed new duties uh, during the COVID times um, in um, organization and response to COVID, as, as well as Laura Rumpler, who works together with Alex to make sure that uh, the community and the NIC community have the most recent information about what NIC is doing in their COVID response. And it was a wonderful, delightful presentation, really. Um, then we have our staff assembly forum and good of the order, which this uh, last meeting, we presented the idea of adopting to staff assembly, a parliamentarian at our meetings, which sometimes can be a, a very important and a very needed piece to our meetings, which was um, met with a great deal of positive feedback and, and uh, Senate, uh, also the college Senate, as a parliamentarian, just to make sure that uh, meetings are conducted in a proper way and they go smoothly and within uh, a timely fashion. So that was something that we will present in the future to um, our staff assembly to be voted on uh, under good of the order. Uh, Folks don't always know this, but we do a, a, a raffle for those in attendance who have taken the time out to attend our meetings. It's been a little trickier since uh, we started going completely online, um, but uh, one of our uh, staff members who does a great deal of fishing up in Alaska kindly donates some delicious salmon to be raffled off at, at every meeting. And a couple of people get to uh, get some uh, wonderful salmon. I've actually won myself in the past. It's amazing. Uh, uh, Gary is so generous with uh, the salmon that he has. And that's when we adjourn. Uh, if there are any questions I can entertain, I'd be happy to do that now. Board, are there any questions for Jeff? Well, you're right. Robert's rules of orders can uh, be helpful. So hopefully that goes smoothly <laughs> if, if you implement that. Indeed, sir. <laughs> well, Jeff, thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, do you have questions? Excuse me. President McKenzie. Uh, Trustee McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Jeff, uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, uh, I just remember the staff vote. Uh, there was lessons learned, I'm sure, uh, for securing the vote. And I was just wondering what initiatives the, the staff assembly has done to, to secure the vote and maybe that those initiatives could be socialized with faculty and ASNIC. I was just wondering. Uh, um, excellent question. Every now and then, in an organization, something comes along that you absolutely did not expect. And that's what happened to us. Um, quite the learning curve. And um, so the next time that we entertained a vote, we had a moderator who would, uh, would actually try to, uh, and we were quite successful at identifying each person who came in to give a vote through a Zoom format um, mm. and, and making sure it was the right person. Is this perfect? I'm not sure yet, but we are indeed looking into ways. This can be a tricky business um, with being transparent and all of us, according to our mission, trying very hard to be stewards within the community and making sure that the community has uh, its voice, but 
but also securing the voice of the employees of the college. And, and of course, as we've all learned a great deal about um, public requests for information, it, this has not been easy. I, I will admit that. And uh, a lot of discussion surrounds this. Is there anything this board can do to help secure future boards? Do you, uh... Or to, to secure future votes, do you need a, a policy that enables um, the committee to, to form that? Or that's for the staff assembly, but will you um, maybe everyone can bring that to their committees and, and so start socializing that discussion of um, how we can successfully do it in the future? If anything, maybe just meeting with the Kootenai County, uh, who's, who's the people who do our local elections? The clerk's office and have them coming to share maybe to your staff assembly um, or whatever ideas. Um, it's important to get it right in the future. I want everyone's vote um, to be, you know, that's nobody, everyone can vote properly and have integrity of the vote. So it's hard enough at the federal, state, and local <laughs> level. And obviously, indeed. Uh, so. Trustee McKenzie, that's a, a incredibly generous, and um, I, I, I'm so glad that you brought that up because it really is something that we need to address and that we need to uh, make sure as an NIC community and as representatives to the community that uh, one more we make sure everybody uh, has their voice and, and that it's secure and they, and they have confidence. If people don't have confidence in what they're voting for, they're not going to vote. And I would say, especially in my constituents, uh, folks that are always concerned that they can be heard yet keep their job security. So I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And uh, we will certainly discuss that. One last question. Is the staff assembly, is it closed form or open form to the public where the public, if they wish to comply with the mass rules and all that can uh, Yeah, according to our constitution, indeed, like, uh, like faculty assembly, it is closed to employees and, uh, and staff only, um, again, this has not been a thing <laughs> and and now it is mm -hmm. and so uh we really we really have to learn especially in the learning curve of the zoom age and and you i'm certain know as well as i do this isn't going away um the uh the genie is out of the bottle and Zoom is certainly going to be incorporated as well as other platforms for uh, public and private comment is going to be something that uh, we're all going to have to address in the future moving forward. And uh, certainly conversation right now. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board? All right, Jeff, thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate that. My pleasure. Next is, next is Senate, uh, Steve Kurtz, please. Good evening. Thank you, Chair Banducci. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Dr. McLennan. Uh, just a brief update on uh, the last two meetings of the Senate that took place during the month of March. And uh, at our last regular meeting held on the 18th, uh, we had uh, Chris Martin present the first reading of uh, Office of Finance and Facilities Operations Policy, and this is one of the very first policies that is going through the, uh, the official chain uh, with the seven-year cycle of the board policy revision that was passed by the board last year. So thanks to Chris and his leadership uh, with, and, and also the ad hoc team moving forward with that. Under old business, we've been focusing on, I sound like a broken record, but we're finally reaching the end, but we did have the first reading of the revisions to the Senate Constitution and Bylaws. 
and a lot of cleanup, as you can see in front of you, just a, a, a lot of stuff that we just wanted to make sure is accurate. Uh, for example, that uh, the vacancies, just in case we have a Senate that is filled by the appropriate constituency group, uh, the, the role of the past chair, uh, that the chair of the Senate alternates between the faculty assembly and staff assembly. Uh, similar to the uh, staff assembly, uh, we are, we do have, we just realized we have in our constitution, the role of parliamentary, but it was the only office that didn't have the definition. So thanks to our senators with providing us the information uh, with moving forward, uh, we're adapting the, uh, the role of corresponding secretary to assist the chair with changes to the board policy. It can be quite tricky uh, moving through the first two readings, keeping track of all the changes that are requested and approved by the senators. We also are coming into the 2020s with our notification requirements uh, with our meetings. We're uh, updating now so that uh, our notifications just have to be posted electronically and available to the College Senate for both our regular meetings and special meetings. We're also reducing the notification of special meetings from five working days to two working days. Uh, then we proceeded on to order, a uh, good of the order, and we had our senators involved with working with Ken Wardinsky and Melissa Mawinney with uh, the redesign of the college website. That does impact the way that our board policies could be presented down the road. So uh, the administration asked us and, and through Ken's leadership to come up with a, a smaller committee. So they provide a little bit of update. And I believe that Ken will be providing an update to the entire Senate at our next meeting next month. Uh, that concluded the regular meeting. And as I mentioned to the board during the last meeting uh, that uh, with my statement that was gonna be presented uh, to the uh, North College Senate and they did adopt on March 3rd, a a uh, resolution uh, regarding the statements of the uh, ASNIC, the faculty assembly, and the staff assembly, NIC's board of trustees obligation to uphold NIC's policy. There was really minimum discussion. There was a, a working session three days prior to that, actually it might've been a week prior, but we did not have the three days notice that was in our constitution and bylaws. So we, we did spend some time working on it at a, a prior meeting, but we did have to give uh, the three days notice. So when the meeting took place on March 3rd, it was over in uh, seven minutes. Uh, so that concludes the March, th the information from the March 3rd. And our next meeting is April 15th, uh, starting at noon. Uh, that concludes my report. Chair Banducci, are there any questions? Board, are there any questions for Steve? I have a question. Trustee McKenzie. With the questions of the prior three, you may be able to guess. And um, is the Senate open to the public to observe? Uh, Chair Banducci, uh, Trustee McKenzie, my understanding is it is not. It, it's uh, only open to senators and the guests. Uh, it, my, uh, very similar to the response that uh, came from the faculty assembly. Uh, if, if anyone would like to attend the meetings, uh, they, I, I would recommend uh, that person contact the executive committee and uh, normally, uh, in, a, in a normal situation, uh, policy, I think policy work is very exciting, but pr probably for the average person, it, it may not be. Uh, but given our times that we're in, I can see why someone might be interested in attending our meetings. Anything else? Are there any other questions for Steve? All right, Steve, I don't hear any. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. All right, that brings us to the president's report. Uh, President McLennan, please. Good evening, everybody. I'm gonna keep my comments brief this evening. Uh, generally, the college is uh, cascading toward the end of the spring semester as in normal, our normal academic cycle. There's a lot of activity that uh, kind of bunches up towards the end of the semester. And as we hit April and May, uh, it gets pretty active. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, there's a lot of activity going on right now to plan for uh, the upcoming fall semester. Uh, a couple things I do want to mention. Uh, one, uh, Trustee Banducci and I met with the ACCT uh, consultants that the board um, 
asked uh, to uh, ask us to uh, contact and contract with. Uh, the, I sent the board a, a note on that process in terms of what happens next. Uh, we are still waiting to hear back from Trustee Banducci about the uh, the uh, references that he requested to follow up on with the uh, two uh, consultants, and um, I'm, I'm assuming he'll speak to that uh, tonight. Uh, Shannon's reached out to you to try to get a couple of meetings, ske <clears throat> excuse me, scheduled uh, that are uh, in um, conjunction with the uh, budget uh, development process. One is the uh, compensation study workshop, uh, trying to hold that in early April, the two by two or one by one budget uh, meetings and the uh, a May board workshop on budget and capital. So many of you have responded to those, and I'm not sure that she's reached out to you for each one of those. Uh, and then also, uh, if she hasn't already, we'll be reaching out to you for the ACCT full day retreat. Um, that will be a nine to four uh, retreat <clears throat> uh, in person. Uh, hopefully uh, everybody can make that. And um, uh, just a plug to respond to Shannon uh, as in a, as timely fashion as you possibly can. And that will conclude my report. Does anybody have any questions for President McLennan? I have one. Uh, Trustee McKenzie has a question. Uh, President McLennan, I'll um, notice you didn't uh, address the recent Chronicle article about our university. Is there any public comments uh, you'd like to say about it? I, I couldn't uh, hear the question. Uh, do you, um, there was a recent Chronicle article about our university. I was wondering if you wanted to make um, any public comments on the article. Uh, you know, if I had intended to do that, Trustee McKenzie, I would have included that with my report but I have none at this moment. Thank you. Okay. Um, Cause I've been, I noticed you have been making uh, public statements and, and that that's right. But I would just like to read one of those and, and ask you a follow-up question. Um, thank, thank you, Linda. Uh, so the, the Chronicle was the titled, a county turns against its college. And um, President, uh, President McClendon, uh, you, you tweeted, uh, thank you, Linda. We're not going down that easily. Our faculty and staff are amazing and resilient, which I would agree. This is difficult to be sure, which I would also agree. Celebrating 88 years, we will be here tomorrow. And um, as, as this is a public statement, uh, I was just wondering what, what you mean by we're not going down that easily. Uh, and specifically, I was hoping you would address who is trying to take you down. I don't have anything to add to my comments that I've made. I think they speak for themselves. I have nothing to add. But thank you for the question. All right, I have yeah. one more question. Did you wanna address uh, your email to me about undermining you. Um, and Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I don't Christy, think I'm not recognizing you at this time, please. Yeah, it's not appropriate. Trustee McKenzie, uh, Trustee McKenzie has a person, follow on question. If you have a personnel discussion, we can do an executive discussion. This is absolutely inappropriate, and you know it if the as a board chair. going to make accusations in the public record, which are public emails. I feel like Todd. I have the ability to afford Todd. myself. You know better. Stop. 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 Trustee McKenzie. Hmm. I feel like I've been attacked by me for a phone call that I haven't even made. Understand. Maybe we need to take that. We need to address that at a different time. It is, you know, it has been challenging. There's been a lot of things put out in the public and there's been little chance to discuss it publicly. And some of us have probably uh, been a little frustrated by that situation. 
So I'm not sure when is always the best time to have these conversations or discussions. Well, our <laughs> trustee Wood, if we may identify her, she's the one who called for the meeting and she seemed to have something that needed to say with regarding to my Steve Kurtz. I would love to hear it. Yeah, well, I don't work for you, Greg, and let's move on with no. the agenda. So I guess it can come back up when we're talking about the conduct policy. Do you have any other questions? No, I don't. Okay. Are there any other questions for President McLennan? Uh, hearing none, we will move on. The next person on the agenda is Beth Ann Fuller. Beth Ann, are you ready? I am, thank you. Beth Ann, can I ask you a question? Sure. This is the second reading. If, if the other trustees agree, would you be open to doing the Reader's Digest version on this? Um, you, oh, definitely. So Chair Banducci and trustees and Dr. McLennan, uh, the statement, only statement that needs to be made is that this is the second reading of our continuation grant for the year 2021-22. And I'm open for any questions anybody might have about the, um, the application. Thank you, Beth Ann. Trustees, does anybody have any questions for, for Beth Ann? regarding the Head Start continuation grant application. Mr. Chair. Yes, Ken, please, uh, uh, Trustee Howard. Yeah, I'd, in order to move this forward, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the um, uh, application as it stands. Mm -hmm. That Seconded. sounds great. Would someone like to second? Seconded. Now we can Was have a Michael? discussion. Yes, it is. All right, thank you. Uh, Trustee Barnes second it. Uh, Trustee Howard made the motion. Is there any further discussion? If not, we'll put it to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I heard four and I'm five. Five ayes. That motion carries unanimously. All right. Beth Ann, you have the next one also. Uh, again, did not keep you too long. Give us the, what we got to know on this one. So thank you for... Um considering for action, accepting our funding increase for cost of living adjustment. And that supplemental funding came in on March 17th. So you, um, Chair Banducci, I believe you received the actual letter. It was too late for the board packet, but we were offered uh, $39,931 to bump our wage scale by 1.22% and to use the uh, the remaining for any increased fringe. And that is due April 15th. And that is why it's listed as an action and not um, a second reading would be after the grant is due. Yes, ma'am, I, I did receive that. And I do understand the urgency of this. Could I, <clears throat> would someone make a motion, if you would please, that we would waive the second reading and take action at this time on this. Can I have that motion? So moved. Okay, Christy, you made the motion. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. Oh, okay. Uh, two seconds. Trustee McKenzie and Trustee Howard. All right, we have a motion, a second. Any discussion? All right, we'll vote. Uh, everybody in favor of waiving the second reading and taking action tonight, please say aye. 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 Yeah, I, I also, that's five, that's unanimous. Okay, so Beth Ann, do I just need to have someone make a motion that we approve your accepting of the funds? Um, yes, sir. And there's only one other piece to that and that's the COVID-19 funding that is on its way, but we do not know the amount and we have not received when that would be due. But if it were to be due before April 15th, along with the uh, the, COLA funds we just asked to, to be able to accept COVID-19 funds into this um, program year to mitigate any costs of, that were due to COVID-19. Okay. So I don't have Mark Lyons next to me here right now. Normally he'd be helping me in figuring out exactly what this motion sounds like. So we're gonna make a motion 
I need someone to make a motion, but it's gonna say that you can go ahead and accept the funding increase for cost of living adjustment and that you'll be allowed to accept the supplemental funding for COVID-19 response when it is received. Yes, sir. That sound right? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Do I have someone willing to make a motion on that, please? So moved. Christy, thank you. Chris, uh, Trustee Wood made the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Trustee Howard, thank you very much. Is there any discussion, any questions for Beth Ann on that? All right, I'm not hearing none. Not hearing any, there are none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, chair also votes aye, uh, that's five to zero. Passage unanimously. Uh, Beth Ann, uh, continue to do the great work you're doing. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, everything is approved and uh, take care of those kids. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Have a great evening. All right, the next item on the agenda is uh, as an action item, President's Compensation and it is Mark Lyons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. As I mentioned uh, back in, in February, uh, in June, the board and the president agreed to a new contract. At that time, the, the budget was not yet approved. And so there were no increases for employees uh, or the president. The board later that fall agreed to step increases for employees to take effect January of 2021. Trustees are act to consider whether the president's contract should be amended to reflect the uh, effectively the same uh, step increase um, that is, was discussed by the board at the time. The financial impact of, of, of that would be an, an amendment to the contract that would effectively be um, $363.88 per month. Um, so the trustees had discussed having this, this come up and so it is for the board to consider whether to make that uh, adjustment to the president's contract. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yes, Ken. Yeah, I would like to make a motion that we approve the president's compensation increase of $363.88 per month retroactive to January of this year. All right. I'll we, that we, all right, we have a motion on the floor. We have a second. Is there any discussion? I have discussion. All right, uh, Trustee McKenzie. Uh, just some numbers to put it in context of what we're talking. It's only 2%, but that 2% equates to just over $4,000. And a 2% for the average faculty is about $1,000. Um, while the president is a well-qualified individual, um, if we gave the same for about 4,000 to the average Coeur d'Alene salary for 2019, that would be about a 10% increase to put those numbers in context. So okay. that's the only discussion I have. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Mr. Chair. Um, that's an interesting comment, but actually Trustee we're Howard. not asking members of the public to be the president of a community college with all the responsibilities that go with it. And the competition that we're looking at is really the president of other you know, uh, institutions of higher learning. The four-year institutions are dramatically higher than that. Uh, we're about mid-range with regard to the other community colleges in the state. So. This is uh, well within the range of a reasonable increase in salary. All right. Thank you. Uh, Trustee, Trustee Barnes, is that you? No. Oh, thought, thought I heard something. One more. Just, just, a, just, a, just a moment. Was there someone else that was starting to speak? Okay. Uh, Trustee McKenzie. Uh, during my time in San Diego, there was a time called the, the Sunshine Tax, where it's a great place to live, and the wages were actually one of the lowest for a big city in California. So, um, and it, uh, while I am aware that the OSU uh, president who just resigned 
uh, I think he's getting paid around 800,060 um, a year. Uh, I, I think in general, uh, wages for presidents at the universities, there's gonna be a lot of scrutiny in general. And um, in context of our community and it's a taxpayer funded university, I don't think it's the best uh, judicial uh, use of our money right now. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments or questions or anything else? Yes, Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. Thank you. Um, just to, to remind Trustee McKenzie, you, I think you accidentally keep calling us a university and we're a community college. Um, just a refresher, the last time the board talked about the president's compensation, it was the president who asked us to delay the conversation, wait until after we made a decision on the budget. This was a prior board make a decision on the budget, and then he would abide, live with whatever that decision was made as far as compensation. And our past practice is whatever compensation we give to the rest of the campus is what the president gets for uh, a COLA the coming year. So I would agree with uh, Trustee Howard that we need to honor this and also make it retroactive. Okay, are there any other comments or questions? All right, I'm hearing none. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those not in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. All right. I'm not sure of the optics of, of spending more money on salaries right now. But the motion carries at this time. Next item on the agenda is under new business. Tab three, we have the first reading action of the revised leave without pay policy, 3.04.06. And it's the reason. Uh, rescinding of policies 3.040601 and 3.04.07. And Karen Hubbard will be leading this discussion. Karen, are you ready? I am. Can you hear me? I sure can. Would you please feel, go ahead. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Banducci and trustees. Uh, as the college continues the ongoing review of all of our policies, we have another employment related policy for your consideration. This policy has been reviewed by the HR team, President's Cabinet, and gone through two readings at the Senate before being approved to bring forward to you. So tonight I am presenting for a first reading, policy 3.04.06 on leave without pay. Uh, you will note that the revision of the policy we're proposing to eliminate two other policies uh, and incorporate their content into this one. They both pertain directly to leave without pay. They're both brief policies have been included uh, with your materials. And, um, and this way, uh, all of the information related to leaves without pay is contained in one single policy. Um, in addition to combining the three existing policies, the revised version moves the approval for leaves without pay to the president's cabinet member and ultimately the president. So if you have any questions, um, though we're not looking for an action since this is a first reading, um, but I would be glad to, to answer any questions you might have. All right, board, are there any questions for Karen regarding this topic? Mr. Chair? Yes, Trustee Wood, uh, go ahead. I, I would call it more of a comment. Um, Karen, I read this over and I, I think I understand the, the reason that maybe the, the board would not be included in this decision because it's, we really wouldn't have any personal knowledge of the employee and what they were going through, um, probably is more appropriately in the hands of the administration. Mm -hmm. But I will say, even though I do understand with current times, um, I don't think you, I don't think it's wise to write policy around people 
or current boards or whatever the situation may be. And I'm not saying you're doing that or anybody's done that. Um, I think that ultimately when decisions left with a board, it, there's a reason that it comes to us. It is our oversight. Uh, I trust that the board would do the right thing, make the right decisions. And so I guess I'm just struggling with that piece of it. And um, I'll, I'll wanna listen to what my other board members say, but not saying I won't support the changes. I, I'm just, I'm really contemplating that. All right, thank you, Trustee Wood. Are there any other comments or questions? All right, not hearing any. I, I also do have a couple of thoughts on this. And uh, I'm quite inclined to agree with, with Christy on this, with Trustee Wood. In fact, to be quite candid, I, I'd like to see the approval of sabbaticals to be, to be back under the uh, auspices of the Board of Trustees and uh, to us for approval or disapproval. That had been something that had been under our purview and then, uh, and then was taken uh, out of our purview a, a number of years ago. And I, I'd actually like to see that back under our purview. Uh, I, again, to Trustee Wood's point, there are, are reasons for that oversight. We, we hopefully will make good judgment calls and, and be wise about it. Staff hopefully will prepare us to make wise uh, reasoned decisions, giving us uh, both the 10 foot and the 10,000 foot view and the ramifications of these different requests and what that looks like for uh, in personnel actions. And, you know, is the person a single point failure? Is there backup? What, what's that gonna cost? Do we have to hire a new person to replace them? You know, maybe what's the life situation that, that, that as much as can be disclosed or shared, you know, that facilitates this, this action. You know, so there's a bit to it and there's a bit of that that goes into the education of the board uh, by, by the administration. Um, but I, I think um, the authority is, is there for a reason and, and I'd like to see it maintained. And, and again, I, I'd like to even make a recommendation that the, uh, the sabbaticals come back under the purview of the uh, board of trustees and whatever mechanism it is to, to, to uh, initiate that process. So th those are my comments. Uh, does board, does any of the other trustees have any comments? I have a comment. Uh, Trustee McKenzie. I think it would be wise to keep the leave without pay um, under the purview of the board of trustees and maybe even say, leave it up to the chair. And if the chair deems it pertinent to uh, solicit the other trustees vote. Uh, I would like to see wording like that. All right, thank you. Um, we, I did get an email this past week regarding that there may be a, a current uh, leave without pay situation from President McLennan. And he had informed the board that the normal practice had been, uh, to Trustee McKenzie's point, uh, that the president and the board would work through that together and uh, unless there was some extenuating circumstances there, or the rest of the board had to be engaged. And he had asked the rest of the board if they had any uh, uh, problem with that process or that normal practice. As, as far as I know, there were no negative replies to that or any concerns that between the president and I, we couldn't exercise good judgment and, and hopefully do what's best for the school and for the employee, make a wise decision. So a couple ways that could go, but apparently in practice, that's something that the president and the chair have handled uh, previously. It, would, would, would that sound correct um, from the prior chairs or from the president? Is that, that's what I understood from the email. I'd like to make a comment on that, Chair Banducci, if I could. Certainly, uh, President McLennan. So I think in the time that I've been here, we've, I've had maybe two, maybe three, but I think two requests for leave without pay. So that's two in a five-year period of time. They usually involve pretty intricate personnel issues or personal issues with, with folks. And I believe that the reason that it's been defaulted to uh, just consultation with the board chair is because of the, the either the timing or the inconvenience to convene the board around uh, such a narrow subject as uh, one employee's uh, uh, leave without pay uh, request. So I, I made that uh, recommendation or asked that question to the full board in my email uh, for expedience uh, purposes to actually get the decision to be made without having to go into executive session. However, hearing the comments that I'm hearing here, if the board truly does believe that this is something that the board should have input in, 
then the full board should be doing that, not one individual. That should not be a delegated responsibility to make a decision that the board believes it should be making. Mr. Chair. Uh, Trustee Howard. Yes. Yes. As I, as I look at this particular argument, but I think this, what I'm gonna say um, really covers a larger area. I think we all, as a board, we need to keep in mind that our role essentially is to develop policy. And there are sometimes difficult uh, decisions to be made about where the policy ends and the procedure begins. But this is one of those areas where the board would be hard pressed, quite frankly, to be able to understand the impacts on the institution of somebody requesting pay without leave. And that's why I think it's been defaulted to the president as part of the operational duties of the, of the institution and of the president. Um, so I just, I wanna make sure that we don't, because we're interested in how it turns out, that doesn't necessarily mean that we ought to assume the responsibility of making that decision. We delegate a lot of decisions to the institution and to the president because those are operational issues that really should be decided within the entire envelope of operational uh, considerations, many of which we may not understand at all. So I think uh, some of these uh, decisions uh, like pay without leave is something that should be left in the hands of the president, quite frankly. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any other comments or questions? Uh, Trustee Banducci, if I may. Uh, uh, Karen, just, Karen, just a moment. Was there somebody else there? It was kind of a muffled something. Okay, I'm sorry, Karen, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to point out one difference between leave without pay and sabbatical decisions. Sabbaticals are, um, we, we typically do receive those every year. In the last um, 10 years, we have received for leave without pay requests. Um, so they're, they're, they are much less frequent, but they are, as we've already discussed, tend to be um, sensitive, personal related situations. And so we would do it that way um, in, in, in terms of you know, the sensitivity and the time sensitivity of, of the decision. Um, significantly, there's, um, there's not Obviously, there, there's no pay. There's a much, um, uh, you know, much lesser uh, financial cost. Um, really, uh, almost almost nothing to the institution to approve a leave without pay, um, as compared to a sabbatical. So, so they are. Um, I, I just want to point out the differences between those two um, those two approval decisions. That that there's. Um, a, a much more significant financial impact to approving sabbatical decisions as compared to leave without pay. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, uh, Trustee McKenzie. Uh, President McLennan, I'm, I'm understanding that the policy for sabbaticals was written in 1985 and uh, operating procedure, it seems to have fluctuated since it was initially written as in the board. Uh, has on and off had say with um, sabbaticals. Is that true? I don't know the full history of uh, uh, the policy and what's happened in practice. Um, I'm only hearing from uh, in, from others what the practice uh, had been at some point over time. Uh, what I see in the policy itself uh, does not require sabbaticals to um, uh, does not require board board approval. Um, that practice, uh, uh, the current practice that uh, is happening today uh, has been in place uh, well before my time at NIC. So it's not a, it's not a change that I made. It's just uh, as far as I can tell, when I look at the policy and read the policy, the colleges, the administration is following the policy. Mr. Chair. Yes, Trustee Howard. Um, yeah, could I suggest that if there's going to be a discussion about the policy involving sabbaticals that we put that on the agenda separately, it's not on the agenda for tonight. And um, 
but we do have um, the the existing policies that are being presented, and I, I'd like to direct our conversation to those. Certainly, no, I was actually going to I was actually going to suggest that we maybe bring up. I just saw it as a parallel topic, and I thought it was a natural segue. Just in the brief discussion, I didn't expect it to quite elongate quite like it did. But I was trying to look at those two as examples. And as Christy talks, uh, had talked about Trustee Wood, a little bit of the a little bit of the erosion of our authority on some of these different things, that brought me to mind about how we had been in charge of sabbaticals, and that had has changed. And here we are here, and we're looking at maybe making that change. And and this is just a um, a, a first reading, and it's a discussion. So we can certainly put a topic of discussing sabbaticals on a future agenda. I have no problem with that. Um, what I'm trying to gather from, we have a very uh, diverse field of, of comments and questions here, mostly comments. I'm not sure if we've given Karen a, a clear direction here. Can I make one? We're, uh, Trustee McKenzie, yes, please. Um, the, the topic of the sabbaticals came up because I thought Jared Banducci in like a conversation in November or December, you mentioned something to me about how it was recently changed. Um, I mean, it's memories are always hazy, but it, it seems like if, if that was under the board's purview, which it, it seems like it wasn't, but I'm just relying on my own memory of conversations. Um, and then and this one's not going under the boards of trustees purview. It just seems like there's a steady erosion in my mind. So I, I at least will be voting pretty strongly uh, to keep right. this and, uh, and, board's purview. And I don't remember, to be truthful, the conversation, and maybe Trustee Wood or Trustee Howard can help me with this. It's happened since, I, I'm pretty sure it's happened since I've been on the board, so that's been eight and a half years, but that could have predated uh, President McLennan. So I would yeah, put it somewhere, what, about the five to seven year time frame when that occurred. And I, I couldn't tell you exactly when that happened. So. Well, um, I, I recognize the need to maintain confidentiality in these uh, leave without pays. And uh, Mark Lyons, is is there a policy where we could grant the board chair uh, to make the decision to provide minimum need to know of other trustees? Um, Mark, did you hear the question? Mr. Mr. Chairman, is uh, yes, please. Am I on now? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I, I don't know that we have that written in policy, the delegation of by the board to uh, a chair to make that decision. Um, so if, if that's your question, I don't, I don't recall that we have a policy. Maybe somebody else does. Um, that, that has, as I understand it, been the practice on leave without pay, but, but uh, leave without, without pay, I think, as Karen Hubbard has suggested, that is, that is not that is a leave. It is not a sabbatical, and it's and it seems to me that it's more of a. Um, Forgive me. Did I say sabbatical? I meant, I meant to say leave without pay. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, like, could we could we make a policy to, um, like, could we write in the policy instead of the board of trustees? Could we say the chair of the board of trustees? Is that permissible? Well, I assume it is permissible. It's if, if it's a board policy and it goes through the channels, so. Yes, there are. That would be permissible to, to make that delegation to to uh, to uh, the chair. Well, if, if I may, uh, Mark, is there any is there anything that prevents us because of the infrequent nature of leave without pay to continue with the current practice as it's understood? No, I don't believe there is. For, for simplicity, unless we want to do something more official or formal. Yeah, I, I think the point okay. here on, on, on the uh, amendments is to bring these these different policies together because they are old and clean them up and, and make it uniform so so that going forward. And I think as, as Karen Hubbard had mentioned, the, these this is really mostly a, an HR issue. It's not a it's not a granting of a sabbatical that's going to cost the institution uh, money. So it seems to me that's more of a personnel related issue. And we, over the years, we have tried to move these operational personnel related issues where they were tied to the board back to the administration. 
So that's that's my sense of the history. Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank you Mark. Uh, Trustee Wood. Um, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that I, if I indicated that I think there's a steady erosion of the board authority, that is not, those are not my statements at all. I, I just, uh, whenever I look at policy, I want to make sure it's for the organization and it's not policy around a current board or our current personnel. Um, Trustee Howard made some very good points and so did President uh, McLennan. So I think between now and the next board meeting, we'll just have to, to really put some good thought to it. I, I don't have any revisions to suggest to you tonight, Karen. I'd just like some more time to think about it. All right, Th thank you, Trustee Wood. Um, well, we do have, obviously till the next board meeting, um, Would we, uh, I guess, here's the question I have. I'm thinking out loud. And, and Mark, I need a little guidance here, I think. Again, we're not really giving, giving Karen much guidance and she's got a process that she's working and we've had a lot of discussion. And again, that discussion's gone in several different directions. Would it be possible if, if after further review as, as Trustee Wood has suggested, if any of us have any input or, or line items or line, can we each uh, can we each individually forward those to, or maybe this question should go to President McLennan, forward those to Karen for her consideration, or see if she can compile those inputs. Not quite sure what this process looks like because I suspect at this point that there may be some some changes that some of the trustees might want to make. Okay, well, how do we proceed? Mr. Yes. Chair, um, yes. you know, I, I think in the ordinary course of events, um, there would be a proposal like this that's brought to the board. And then uh, on the second reading, if somebody wants to make an amendment to it, then we would vote on the amendment and we would have specific language that is provided at that time to invite uh, five trustees to potentially give separate um, rewrites to the um, to the presenters, I think just would be a lot of confusion. I think we ought to do it at a board meeting. And if somebody wants to make a specific change to the language, and we do that as an amendment, we get a second and we vote on it. Uh, uh, Trustee Howard, I, I believe you're correct. I think that has been a, the normal practice uh, for the most part. And, and to your point, I think it probably would be a bit unwieldy for all of us if, if all of us uh, decided to provide input to Karen. So, uh, President McLennan, yes. So this this policy has come to the board um, through the, uh, the process of developing policy to get it to the board, which as you know, moves through uh, various channels through the College Senate to the president's cabinet from the president to the board. Um, if there's a, a desire to alter or modify, it's not unusual for the board to share those concerns with the president or in this context of a public meeting. And I would then take it back to the college and, and back to those constituent groups for its consideration. It could be that if you recall when we, uh, we had quite a bit of back and forth on the step policy um, several years ago. And, uh, and it took some back and forth between the Senate between the administration and between the board to get that language. I don't think this one's that complicated given the issue that we're talking about right here, but the channel really is to uh, give the college a chance to respond to the board's concern about the policy and let us consider that. And it could be that what comes back to the board does not resolve what the board uh, direction ultimately would like it to be. And the board then would uh, amend uh, that as possible. But as, as far as this policy that you have in your hands today, this is the policy that's come to you from the administration through that process. Okay, may I ask a question here then? Let me summarize that. Do I take that to mean that at this point that we should accept it as is at the next board meeting? And then if we wanna do any uh, amending, slicing and dicing, do it then? Or are you telling me you'd rather have us give you some inputs to you in the interim to give you a chance to work on it and do some uh, 
adjustments to it to bring it back to the next board meeting? Which of those two paths are you suggesting? Either, either one of those is fine. I just, my, my, I guess my point is, and I apologize for if I didn't state it clearly. And I apologize if I didn't catch it or get it, it. That is that there's an iterative process between the, the, the governance process within the college as it comes to the board. And it, it would be uh, respecting that process to give it back to the governance process to consider those alterations, whatever those might be. Mr. Chair. Trustee Howard. Yes. Um, what um, President McClendon is indicating, I think is correct. Um, but if, if they want to pull this um, uh, modification of this, of this um, policy and, and reconsider it given this discussion, they have the right to do that. It doesn't have to come back up on the agenda next month. It can be reconsidered and brought back when uh, the administration and the process that it may go through has been completed. All I'm saying is if this comes back in this form next meeting, then we can amend it if we need to. If what they want to do is pull it in the meantime and reconsider it or even uh, redo it and represent it to us, that's fine. I think that's that's uh, honoring the, the uh, contributory process that we use here. Uh, but I think if it comes back to us in this form, then we have a way of modifying it if we feel it's appropriate. Fair enough. All right. May I say one more thing? Uh, Trustee McKenzie. Um, I have reviewed uh, the several sabbaticals that are ongoing right now. And one of them is for educational purposes to obtain a doctorate degree. And along with other research, but I, right now with uh, the hard pandemic times, I guess we're on right now, I, I guess it does come into play. I, I think it would be appropriate to, um, as the leave of absence without pay for educational purposes, as that policy is uh, being rescinded with the proposal of this uh, to at least uh, the, the how this policy was adopted uh, is to include that sabbatical considerations uh, in, in the discussion. All right. Well, I think we can add that in a, in a future uh, to a future agenda for the board meeting. Certainly, sure. well, I think that's fair. And then I guess uh, Karen, if I may, right now uh, we have what you've presented tonight. And I guess we'll see if any of the trustees uh, provide any um, feedback in the interim. And then I guess you guys uh, and have the ability, opportunity, I don't know if you'll want to uh, take this feedback and conversation discussion tonight. And if that will lend itself to you guys wanting to make any adjustments or, or pull it back or, or present it as is next month. So I guess we'll see what, what you guys feel is the appropriate action for you guys to take with this at that time. Trustee Banducci, if I may, if, uh, there yes, is feedback, if there's feedback or questions or communication around this, it would be appropriate for that to be directed to my office. Thank you. Certainly. All right. Next agenda item is uh, tab four. Oh, I'm sorry. Karen, thank you very much, by the way. Thank you. Um, tab four. It's an action item, it's acceptance of the fiscal year 21, A133 federal audit and uh, Vice President Martin will be uh, leading this discussion. Are you ready, sir? Yes, I am, thank you. Okay. Trustee Banducci, members of the board, uh, tonight we're coming before you a little bit unusually with the, uh, the what we call the single audit or the A133 or the uniform guidance audit that looks at all of our federal awards. There was a delay this year um, because of the CARES and COVID funding. The guidance was not released um, by, by the feds for the auditors to actually conduct their, their full audit. So this was not presented in November with the, with the regular college audit, as is our practice. And so that's why this is coming before you tonight. Um, with us, we have Jody Doherty, uh, a partner with Ide Bailey who conducted this audit, um, who's available for questions as well, if you'd like to, to have any further discussion or questions on this topic. 
Board, are there any specific questions to Vice President Martin or to Jody? Uh, sorry, I was I was muted and not allowed to unmute myself. So sorry, Chris. <laughs> I am unmuted now. <laughs> All right. Did you have something that you wanted to add? Um, I can go over the report if you want, but um, if you guys have it in front of you and you didn't have any questions. You know, honestly, if uh, unless there are some specific questions, uh, Chris, if I may, I would just ask you to maybe give us the 30 second Reader's Digest 10,000 foot highlight view of what's good. And if there's anything that's maybe not so good, you know, briefly touch on that. But I mean, what's the highlight that we should take away from this? That we did great, you know. I mean, where are we at? I'm going to defer to Jody to to speak to the, if you will, the grading on this, uh, since I barely conducted the the evaluation. Right. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, there's two letters in this report, and one of them talks about how we did the audit in compliance with government auditing standards, and we did look at controls over financial reporting and compliance with laws and regulations. If we had any issues or findings, um, this is where we would report it. And we did not have any findings. Um, the second letter relates to the specific audit of the um, federal programs. And for sure, we did test student financial aid, um, the aging grant, and the brand new CARES Act funding that's called HERF. Um, we audited all three programs and um, we audited compliance over the requirements and we audit, audited controls over that, um, th that compliance as well. And we did not have any findings related to any of the programs that we audited. So an A plus. No, that sounds great. That's, if you're not in the accounting world, here, here there are no findings sounds a little odd because you think there'd be something <laughs> there in some context, but I understand what that means. Trustee All right. Yes, uh, Vice President Martin. I would just share on page six, seven, and eight, especially for our, our new board members, it lists all of what we call the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. And this is all of the federal money that's coming through the college or to the college, either directly to us or as a, a, a subrecipient or pass through. And so that's what you'll see on page six, seven, and eight. I think that's just important to note. That's really what this is about. It's about all of the federal money that is, is coming to, to, the, to the institution. Thank you for pointing that out. That, that, that would be good for the uh, trustee Barnes and, and, and trustee McKenzie to be aware of uh, for their first time to, to see this as trustees. All right, uh, Chris, is there anything else that you would like to point out or do you think we have this covered? Happy to stand for any further questions, but that's that's all we have um, to present on this topic. All right, thank you. Board, Mr. are there Chair? any additional questions? Mr. Chair? Uh, who is that? Ken Howard. Oh, sorry, okay, Trustee Howard, yes, thank you. Yeah, I think, I, I'm guessing that we needed a, a motion for the board to approve the, the um, audit. And I'm gonna make the motion that the board approve the audit as it as presented. I was going to ask for that. It's an action item. And so we have the motion by Trustee Howard. Did I have a second? Yes. Sure, 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 wait, wait, wait. Oh. I apologize. You, Trustee, just just one, one wording change. Um, a motion to accept the audit. Motion to accept the audit. Thank you. Mr. Trustee Howard, would you like to restate that, please? Yeah, that's fine. I, I don't even remember what I said, actually. Uh, just say uh, you make a motion to accept the audit. I make the motion <laughs> to accept the audit. The board make the um, accept the audit. I'll second Thank that. You. Trustee Wood with the second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, uh, aye. That's five ayes. It, uh, the uh, audit is accepted. Uh, five zero, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is under information and it's also Vice President Martin, it's budget planning overview and the information is in tab five for those with the books. Chris, if you're ready, anytime. Thank you. Chair Banducci, members of the board, this is, is intended tonight just to be an overview of the discussion as we develop the 
FY22 budget, I need to point out, I made a um, an error on the tab. And so if you're reading along on the tab, I just want to note that under discussion, um, we're proposing a general operating budget of $49.86 million. So I've, I have a typo on that line. I just wanted to note that. So as we, as we begin this tonight, I'm happy to walk through this and answer questions, but wanted to share with you um, generally an update on where the college is today, um, fiscally. So as we start the conversation with budget each year, um, we always start this conversation around stewardship and really focusing on the ideals of stewardship. That's one of the college's core values, as well as how that relates to each and every individual on the campus who's a steward of taxpayer dollars and tuition dollars, and that we have a responsibility to our, our campus and to our community to really uh, manage those funds diligently. Wanted to just spend a moment giving you an update on where we are as of February the 28th. Um, we provide this on a monthly basis internally, um, just to look at where we're trending compared to, to budget each year. And so for revenue um, at this time, total revenues for the college as of February 28th, year to date, we're coming in at $34.3 million on a budgeted plan of $32.1 million, um, a large, portion of that is due to our better than um, expected enrollment in the fall semester. And so that has carried us over uh, fairly well. You'll see that total operating revenues are trending about 12% overall better than, than planned um, at this time. And again, a lot of that is attributable to, to the, the fall enrollment. The other key area that you'll want to highlight here is non-operating revenues. Um, it's substantially better than, than planned. And so that is where we're placing all of the funding that's coming through the CARES, or as Jody mentioned, the HERF funds. Um, and so as we receive these, they're coming in as a non-operating revenue, and you'll see them going out on the expense lines in just a second. And so that's really what's driving our, our better than planned revenues. Chris, how, how much of that federal money for, under the CARES Act did we get? Great question. Um, Quite, quite a bit at this point. And so for HERF 1, um, we received $1 million. Uh, it's actually a little bit more than $1 million, $1,080,939 that went directly to students in the form of grants or emergency aid to students. And the college received an additional $1,080,939 that was utilized to um, combat, if you will, or, or manage the expenses related to, to COVID-19. So that included equipment, cleaning supplies, um, as, well, as well as covering for some lost revenues in the housing operation. So that's two plus million at that point. And do we have an idea of, are we expecting additional funds under we, the new we legislation? Are, we are expecting additional funds um, for HERF 2. Um, that, that is about $4.8 million coming to the institution. And again, um, over a million dollars of that is direct aid to students in the form of grants and emergency funds. All right, Th thank you. If it's okay, I'll just move over to the expenses. Yes, please. And so overall, um, you'll, you'll notice total expenses for the college as of February 28th. We're coming in at $28.6 million. Um, on a plan of 31.4. And so um, again, we're, we're trending better than expected. And there's a, there's a couple of really interesting stories here. Um, one of those, you'll notice personnel were trending better than, than planned due to some open positions and some salary salvage that was built into this year's budget. Um, other areas that I think are, are unique, travel, of course, you'll see we're doing much better than planned. The college has dramatically restricted travel uh, Frankly, just due to the COVID-19, there hasn't been a lot of opportunities for, for travel. And so that's a, a big area of savings. Um, we also had quite a bit of savings this year in utilities. This continued to be a very mild winter compared to our norm. And so we've got some, some gain there. And again, where you'll see we're trending maybe up or above, um, one area I'd point out is that tuition remission and grant and aid. That's where we're starting to see that CARES direct grants to students start flowing through. Um, the other area that's trending up dramatically is the supplies budget. And again, a lot of that is related to CARES expenses that, that we received funding for um, to combat COVID-19. So overall financial picture for the college, just, just wanted to, to provide this in the context of the budget. 
Um, we're trending really, really well at this moment. We're trending where we would where we've expected to be based off of fall enrollment. Are there any questions for Chris at this point? Chris, I have a couple just quick at glancing at this because noticing some of the savings as you pointed out and, and they, they make sense. Um, supplies is, if I'm seeing this correctly, supplies is higher. Am I seeing that correctly? You are, you are seeing that correctly. So supplies currently, we spent $793,000 and we, we would have planned at this time to spend close to 445. Now, we've got lower on all these others. We've been COVID, we've been virtual supplies. What, how do we account for that being so high then? What would attribute to that? So a it lot of this- not, not intuitive. I, I apologize um, for interrupting. But go ahead. A, a lot of those are, are truly COVID supplies. So there's things like masks. Um, we've, we've added um, ionizers where we actually ionize classrooms every single night. And so all the supplies related to ionizing those rooms, which is a, is a great way to disinfect large spaces. Those are the type of supplies that you're seeing in that line that are above what we would normally have budgeted for. All right, so that's what some of that million in the CARES money or like when they uh, spray the mats for the wrestling. Uh, yes, exactly. And that's stuff like that. Okay. Correct. One more that, okay, that one makes sense. There's a couple others a little bit higher. One that, the other one that kind of jumped out at me was the faculty tenured slash tenure track. Can, can you speak to that? Am I seeing that correctly? You, you are. Um, and so for those of you who cannot maybe see the screen clearly, um, we've spent approximately $6 million as of February 28th on a, a budgeted plan of 5.57. That is strictly timing. And so as we spread these salaries across the year, we often divide that out by 12. And it doesn't always align perfectly with the way the payroll actually comes in. And so that, that at this point is, is a timing issue uh, more than anything else. All right, thank you. That just that number was just big enough. It drew my attention. Absolutely. So, are there any questions to, at this time for Chris or should I have him proceed? Okay. Uh, Trustee McKenzie. So I believe for the past three years, this college has drawn from the reserves is that encompass the 1.7 million of the capital reserve that you mentioned or is that is that factored in here somewhere it, it's it's actually not so um chairman banducci and, and and trustee mckenzie you're correct that the college has budgeted um utilizing the reserve the last two years um as part of the budget but we in actuality we actually haven't had had to use those funds and so um you're not seeing that um presented here because we're not actually touching those unless we would need we would need to. So we're not overexpending at this point beyond our revenue. All right. Oh, great news. Yes. All right. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, uh, Chris, I, go ahead and proceed. Could I just add oh. one other comment to that, Trustee Banducci? Yes, uh, President McLennan. And while that's the case for the last two years, a uh, similar case will be made for prior years where we um, the, the requested, the beginning budget plan that includes fund balance uh, is the expenditure on the, on the expense side at the end of the year is usually very different than what, uh, what the initial plan was. And, and, and almost every year, it's uh, significantly lower. And the last two years, it's, it's, we're zeroing it out. That is good news. Thank you for letting us know that. All right. Um, so, is we, do you have a follow-up question? Well, it, it seems we have a net income of, of five million. As in, does that provide for an opportunity to go more towards uh, beefing up the reserves, or, or, or basically, do we have to start the discussion of how best to utilize that, or? Chairman Banducci and, and Trustee McKenzie, you, you make a great point. So at this point in time, we're at 5.7 million in, in net income. I would just note that that does include um, a substantial part of the capital reserve. That 2.5 line is there. Um, we, will, we will start to use some of that towards the Meyer Health Science expansion. So that number is a little bit inflated at this moment because we haven't had any expenses for the capital reserve this year at this time. But the point still remains, there will be net income at this time we're planning on moving forward and it will go into the fund balance um, at which time 
uh, the board can decide how how to use that. We've generally left that in the in the the general fund balance account. And trust, uh, Trustee Howard will will remember we have moved money over from time to time into the capital reserve. All right. All right, Chris, do you want to go ahead and continue with any of the slides here? Absolutely. Just wanted to give you a brief update on where we are with what we're expecting um, in, in substantial changes coming from the state this year. It was, a, it was a really positive year for North Idaho College. And this is the recommendations that JFAC has made at this point. The big one, of course, is the restoration of the 5% holdback that really impacted us last year. That's a large number, $621,000 that will be going back into to the college this year. Um, there is a positive enrollment workload adjustment for North Idaho College this year. The enrollment workload adjustment is the three-year rolling average of, of enrollments um, weighted against the other three community colleges. So this year, there's $126,500 coming to us um, in enrollment workload adjustment. The governor and JFAC has recommended a 2% change in employee compensation. So that will be included in the revenue projections that you'll see. The governor also made a request for nursing program expansion, specifically for North Idaho College, um, CWI, CSI, and Lewis Clark State College. We would be receiving an additional $200,000 to support nursing in the, in the five Northern counties. And there's a Percy rate holiday again this year, which is, it, it gives us about $46,000. So overall from JFAC, the recommendation this year is $1.16 million. Additionally, the governor has recommended a zero textbook cost initiative of which NIC would receive $250,000. That's being managed through the State Board of Education at this time. And that has not gone through JFAC at this moment to my knowledge, but we're, we're watching that closely. Chris, could, could you quickly expand on what that means? Chairman Banducci, members of the board, this is a, a statewide initiative that the four years were part of several years ago that the two years were not able to participate in. And this is a catch up getting the two, year, two years involved. And it's really an effort to provide uh, free textbooks uh, to, to college students at NIC. I think Dr. McClendon may have more to add on that. Not, not, not on the uh, textbook. I just wanted to uh, let the board know that uh, the, the governor's recommendations and the budget items that Chris has shown you here have passed out of the house and out of the um, Senate. And so, uh, they've been approved and they're just awaiting the governor's signature. So we're in good shape. Does that include, excuse me, Rick, does that include the zero textbook cost initiative? You know, I, I thought it did, but uh, as Chris is presenting this, I'm now not quite sure. I thought it did include that. Um, President McClendon, with the textbook initiative, for, the, for those of us that don't quite understand it, is that any student can... Um, apply for that or is it a driven income driven or need driven or is it just kind of universal for everybody how, how does how is that money um, allocated I'm going to ask Dr. Burns to weigh in on she's actually been uh, fairly involved with uh, the statewide effort to, um, to put this together and uh, so rather than have me misspeak I'm going to go ahead and ask her to not misspeak but to speak Trustee Banducci the Initiative is to um, facilitate faculty, faculty being able to design their courses utilizing a low cost or zero cost textbook. So the, these funds will actually support faculty in beginning to redesign these courses to uh, utilize um, open educational resources as they're norm normally called OER or other types of very low cost or zero cost textbooks for students. Typically how many colleges have, um, we, we actually, let me just say, we do have faculty currently on staff who um, are uh, utilizing um, open educational resources that, that is going on right now. But what the um, goal is to do is to be able to provide options for students in all the general education matriculations, as we call them GEM courses in Idaho, to be able to um, offer courses uh, for students to be able to take these GEM courses as they are matriculating through their programs of study to reduce the overall cost of their education. So we're gonna start with these GEM courses and they're just the general ed courses and um, designate at least a section, hopefully in every of our GEM categories 
that a student would be able to look at uh, and decide whether that's the section they would like to take. Of course, the long-term goal would be to increase the number of those courses available. And um, as this grows, it, it may be that, uh, you know, we eventually would have many, many courses at North Idaho College or a, a great percentage of the courses at North Idaho College utilizing um, open educational resources or zero cost uh, resources for, for these courses. Um, the challenge at this point is the availability of enough of those resources to truly support some of the courses that we offer. You know, particularly uh, the science courses, I think are, are diff uh, the, the number of resources available to support science courses is limited at this point. And so um, we have to be very, uh, use discretion on, on which open educational resources we use and how um, we design the courses to support students use, utilizing those resources. But um, I am extremely excited about the opportunity to be able to um, initiate this plan to be able to reduce the cost of textbooks for our students. All right, thank you. I have a question for Chris Martin. Uh, Trustee McKenzie has a question. Thank you, Chair Banducci. The fund enrollment workload adjustment, I believe our enrollment has kind of steadily declined for the past nine years, but has it de declined less than our peers that we're competing with? So our um, EWA increased? Chairman Banducci, Trustee McKenzie, you, you're correct. Um, our, our declines have, um, have decreased um, from our real peak. So during, during the Great Recession or right thereafter, we had, a, we had a real influx of students. We finally have eaten, eaten that out, if you will, through the, the model. And so now we're back on even keel um, with our sister institutions. So we do have an increase based off of the three-year rolling average. Mr. Chairman. Who, who is that? This is Michael. Oh, Trustee Barnes, please go ahead. I, it's not really a question. It's more a comment. I looked at this and I kind of chuckled. I don't know who comes up with the names, but I, I look at zero textbook cost, cost a quarter million dollars. I don't know who comes up with the name, but it's not a zero cost. It costs a quarter million dollars. So I don't know if a different name could be come up, could be used than that. It's just... Trust, Trustee Barnes, I think we would probably all agree. I see my colleague, Dr. Uh, Burns smiling. This, this is what the legislation was actually called in the line item we pulled from. So duly noted. D duly noted. Chris, one last question for you, if I may, sir. The $200,000 that we're gonna get for the nursing program expansion, do we, do we put that in the bank and piggyback that onto our expansion of the Meyer Health Center as we start to work with the nursing program there? Or are there other, uh, things that this money's earmarked for. Chairman Banducci, again, uh, Dr. Burns may have something she wants to share on that. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to her, but this is ongoing funding um, that is really focused on expanding the capacity of the program. Okay, I'm curious to hear that because that's what we're trying to do by building the new facility because we can't expand until we have more labs and such as I understood it. That's why we're Dr. Burns, spending 8.1 million. Okay, uh, Dr. Burns. Trustee Banducci. <laughs> Trustee Banducci, thank you. Yes, please. Chair Banducci. Uh, this really is designated to be able to hire additional faculty to be able to increase the number of students entering into the nursing program. So we look forward to actually expanding the faculty so that we can serve more students. I will be really honest and say that uh, we do have other limitations and we want to make sure that we address those limitations as we are receiving these funds that so we can continue to add more slots uh, for students to come into our nursing program. And that the other factor, and we've talked about this before in the past, is really related to the clinical education that students get in our area. So half of their lab experience, um, not half, but a portion of their lab experience occurs on our campus in our simulation lab and other labs. But a significant part of their education occurs in the hospitals and other healthcare facilities. So we are only able to grow um, as much as our local facilities are able to accept and accommodate our students to be able to get um, that portion of the hands-on nursing education. So we will be working with um, our local hospitals 
to be able to increase the number of students that they are accepting into their facilities so that we can um, expand the program pro program. But the the funds really were designed for to accommodate nursing faculty positions. Let, well, let me ask a question then for my own edification here. Assuming that we had full participation from all the outside agencies that, that, that we could get, under the current auspices of the program, what is our capacity for nursing students? And then I guess my question would be, after we complete the Meyer Health Center update, what will our new capacity of nursing students be? I mean, what, 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 those, what does that number look like currently if we were able to get to our maximum capability with the partnerships with Kootenai and Northwest Specialty and everybody else? And then again, under the premise that we're gonna have full participation from everybody once we do the expansion and get the extra classrooms and labs and, and continue to add faculty. What do those two numbers look like? Chair Banducci, that is a really tough question. And, and I appreciate your confidence in me and, and even asking me the question, thinking that I might be able to respond um, in a really appropriate way. But let me, let me answer it this way. So there are other factors I would also say that contribute to our decision-making about how many students we accept in any given year, how many students we are expecting to graduate. And that also is what the demand is in our local area because we primarily are preparing students. We want them to, to work locally. Many of our students go um, out of state and across the country to work. But we also have to consider, for example, if we graduated 100 students in the spring semester of any given year, May of any given year, um, the local hospitals would not be able to place that number of students, even if in two years they would have positions open for them, because the orientation and the onboarding of nursing graduates is also a challenge. So we have to work sort of hand in glove with all our healthcare facilities to make sure that we are producing the, the right amount. We know that there's currently a nursing shortage and that shortage is only going to get um, larger as, as we move forward the next three to seven years. So what we have to do is we have to continue to increase the amount of nurses that we produce and nurses that we graduate in alignment with what the capacity is of the hospitals who need to utilize the hospital health care facilities that need to utilize this um, but those students those graduates so it's a really delicate balance it requires a lot of collaboration with our healthcare systems a lot of conversations a lot of communication um, I would tell you that you know I think that our facilities as we grow, uh, right now, we are accepting about 40 students in the fall semester and 40 students in the spring semester. And we are graduating, you know, um, usually under that around 32 or between 32 and 35 students, sometimes a little bit less um, students, both in the spring and the fall. So if we were to bump that up initially by 10 fall and spring, we probably could handle that. As we move forward in another two years, you know, we would probably be able to advance that again, but we really have to do this in unison in conjunction with um, our healthcare systems. All right, well, th thank you very much for that answer. Mm -hmm. Chris, why don't you go ahead and continue? Perfect, thank you very much. So the planning assumptions that we're working on to develop the FY22 budget, just, just briefly, um, our strategic enrollment management team led by uh, Dr. Stanley, um, we're using a recommendation from them for looking at a 3% decline in enrollment for, for next fiscal year. Um, we are looking at accepting new property on the rolls, but no, uh, no levy increase outside of the new property on the rolls, no tuition increase. Um, we're continuing to true up our enrollment in line with our F-121 actuals, which gets us back up to that really positive fall that we've just talked about. Truing up again, revenue streams. We did this last year. We're just making sure that we're capturing the revenue that's coming in. Um, we've had some things that have trended better than planned the last couple of years, making sure that we're not being too conservative in our estimates. We continue to focus on the three-year look ahead and elimination of five positions again next year through attrition. On the expense side, our assumptions are, are looking at restoring those 5% holdbacks or portions of those 5% holdbacks. There were some things that, that we took out this last year that we've got to put back in a couple of those. So that's part of that 5% restoration. We always factor in contractual increases um, into our expense calculations. The continuing cost of cares initiatives, um, Trustee Banducci, you mentioned this earlier, 
because CARES has continued, now we're on, on HERF 2 and there's been an announcement of HERF 3, um, we won't be factoring that in for FY22. We will have an FY22 step factored in on the expense assumptions, the benefit cost increases. Um, we're looking at a part-time um, and adjunct adjustments, as well as implementation of the wage and salary study that the board um, commissioned and strategic budget initiatives. So that's really where we're looking at for expense assumptions for FY22. So we look forward to sharing with you more on the, the wage and salary study. Dr. McClendon mentioned this, I believe in his remarks that there's a workshop coming, um, I believe in the next few weeks to talk through the details of that specifically. All right, are there any questions at this time for Chris? Mr. Chris, Chair. I, oh yes, Trustee Wood, go ahead, please. Thank you. Chris, next year, the city is going to be closing one of the largest urban renewal districts that we have, Lake District. And I'm curious, have you got any preliminary numbers from the county on what that will mean to the college budget? Trustee Wood, we did a calculation on that last year and I apologize, I don't have it on the tip of my head, but we have calculated what we will get when that, when that closes. Um, and so we have not factored that in yet for, for this year, but you're, you're absolutely right. The Lake District will be expiring. Um, and so we do have that calculation. I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but I will make sure I have that next month. That's okay, thank you. Chris, you don't have that number. What sort of just ballpark order of magnitude is something like that? Are we talking in the hundreds of thousands of dollars or? It is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars is, is I believe what our last calculation was on the lakes, the Lake District um, regaining that increase back on the rolls. Okay. Chris, I have two more questions if I may, and then we'll see if anybody else has any. You talked about the elimination of five uh, positions in the next year. Um, are those positions you guys have already identified? Is, did you see them coming up or is that just kind of a, on average, you're gonna, we're gonna lose five and they could be scattered or do you already kind of know where those are gonna be? Jeremy Banducci, that's um, something we look at with every opening that comes up. Dr. McLennan, um, we review every position as it comes open. And so those are, those are done throughout the year through attrition. Um, is how those have come up. Dr. McLennan, do you have anything you want to add on that? No, oh, I just, just, well, I'll just add this, that in the, in the three, the, as we began showing the board last year in the budget development process, we put together, uh, because of the structural uh, elements that were uh, causing some problems downstream for us or into the future, we wanted to make sure that we had a handle on what those impacts were going to be over time. You'll recall that we did the early uh, retirement buyout and uh, also committed to some position reductions in the current year. All of those uh, elements did happen uh, as planned, uh, but they're they're generally by they're they're not um, they're strategic in a sense that uh, uh, we we as Chris said we we consider them at at every opening and a rejustification for the position, but they really are. Uh, taking this approach through opportunity rather than eliminating a specific uh, position through the budget development process. And so far we've been successful with that. Okay. So, okay. Um, last question, the part-time adjunct adjustment. I, I think I saw something in that. So we're gonna plus up their salaries a little bit. That's part of the discussion as we go, walk into the wage and salary study that, that we're presenting to the board. Um, it, it, we have it well noted, uh, Chairman Banducci, that that is something that, that you ask us about every every year, and so we are mindful of that as we as we bring this forward. Thank you. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> I just want to see them get treated equally. So want them to feel valued. So just to to walk through the three year plan briefly, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, um, but essentially you'll you'll see there's a 1.4 million dollar increase in revenues. Um, for this upcoming budget year. And so um, a large portion of that, as we saw, is the JFAC recommendations. Um, so that's that revenue coming in. There's a couple of other pieces on there um, just to make note of um, revenue from the Workforce Training Center. They do a really good job at Workforce Training Center. And, and so we're, we're factoring in revenue to support the institution that comes from Workforce Training Center, as well as we have an estimate of $405,000 for the new property on the rolls. And so, um, Trustee Wood, thank you for the note about Lake City. We'll, we'll make sure we've captured that Lake City piece um, on there. But that's the, the real difference in the budget year over year is that $1.42 uh, million. On the expense side, 
what you'll see is everything that's highlighted in yellow is a decision point. Those are things that that we'll be working working through as we walk forward this proposal. Um, part of that is part of what's re restored from the five percent holdback. Um, another piece of that is obviously the part time and uh, wage study for the adjuncts and part times as well as full time wage study. So that's again that board workshop. And the other one that you'll see there is, is strategic budget priorities that are put in for this upcoming fiscal year. But the budget overall year to year, there's a $1.42 million increase um, in the budget. The majority of that, again, is from the JFAC recommended restoration as a big part of that. Are there any questions for Chris? Chris, I have one quick one. As I'm looking at that, and I look at the FY22 budget at the bottom of the left-hand column, and it's carried over to the top of the right-hand column, I see that 48,441 number again. And when we looked at the blue sheet on tab five, you suggested that we change that to basically 49.6. Is that there is a correct. correction on this sheet that we yeah, should yes, have? Sir. That is correct okay. as well. And so that same number um, is what got carried over into the tab. And so on the screen, I've corrected that. Um, and I apologize, we didn't, we didn't get that corrected in the board book. I gotta be honest, I can't see it, but that's okay. No, no worries. I'll see it later. We'll make sure and send out a revision <laughs> with that correction. No worries, okay, thank you. I have a question, Chair Bandage. Uh, Trustee McKenzie. So we just did the Myers uh, Science Building Expansion. What, what, what is the next big goal? Um, seems like that's relevant for a budget starting to save towards that goal. Does anyone want to offer ideas, including President McLean? Anyone? Trustee Banducci, um, Chair Chairman Banducci, and Trustee McKenzie. We do have a an upcoming budget and capital workshop planned, and so there are some some big topics that we look forward to bringing to the board as we look at, at what might be coming the, down the the pipe, if you will, from a facility standpoint. Um, some of those involve the headland building and entrepreneurship. The board heard about this, I believe, last year as well, with some of the things that are happening around entrepreneurship. So that's that's one piece that that I would note um, that is something that we'll be presenting at the the board workshop. Dr. McLennan, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think you've captured it. It, it, it. There's, as you can imagine, over time, and even when we had the Meyer Health expansion discussion with the board, uh, there are. Facility master plan is now th three years old. Uh, and so as needs change, uh, we wanna make sure that we keep uh, keep that process moving. So uh, the intent is in the May budget workshop to do two things, to do the budget piece of that, and then to switch out of that and do the capital piece and just update. There's a lot of, uh, there's some really interesting things that we have uh, as opportunities in front of us that we wanna bring the board up to speed on. All right, Chris, maybe an unfair question, but off the top of your head with what we've allocated to the Meyer Health Expansion Project, what is our balance in that capital fund and when do we get our next deposit into that and what would that amount be? If you could just even estimate. Chairman Banucci, um, we, we roughly have $8 million that are un, um, unaccounted for. Allocated. Unallocated. They're, okay. they're accounted for, unallocated. Thank you, that's a much better word. Um, that aren't allocated at this moment towards a project. We receive $2.5 million a year um, in, in that fund. We get half of it generally in, in the January period and we get the other half generally um, towards the end of the fiscal year, June, July. So we will be expecting another payment in that account um, towards towards July. So that would plus us up to a little over nine million dollars. No, that's then? that's with the that that is including that amount for this fiscal year. That, that's I mean the new amount you'll get in the June July time frame. Correct. And so that's part of that eight million dollars. I've already counted that for the year. Oh, you've already calculated. I'm sorry. Okay. I apologize for not being clear. No, I, I might have just missed it. All right. Chair so, Manducci, if I may. Um, Trustee McKenzie, we, question. We should not spend all eight million. We would naturally keep the reserves before uh, we, I mean, just, as a family, we generally have three to six months operating expenses. No, uh, would, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, Vice President. So uh, Martin, why don't you add, add, speak to that? Chair, Chair Ducci, uh, Trustee McKenzie, I think we're talking about two different things. So um, the capital reserve 
was what I was specifically talking about. The college does have a general reserve that does, we, we do keep um, around 15% operating expenses in, which is what you're speaking to, that, that continuing fund, if you will, that's separate and apart from what we were discussing as part of the capital reserve fund. Excellent, all good news, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to your presentation, Chris? No, I appreciate the opportunity just to, to bring the board up to speed on how, how the budget development process is, is working, um, working this year. Very good. Board, are there any other questions for Vice President Martin? All right. Hearing none, we'll move on. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you. The next item I have under information is board conduct policy update and that our trustees Barnes and Howard will make that presentation. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, if I might uh, go first and, and then, um, well, Michael and I wanted to make sure we gave you the status report on this assignment. Um, we've had several meetings, um, some very good discussions with regard to setting goals on what we ought to be doing. And we've agreed that we should include procedures along with the policy, which has not historically been done. And that's some of the confusion that comes up. Um, so that brings us to a point of, besides examining the content of 2.01.10, which was rescinded, we're gonna be looking at all the trustee specific policies and procedures, which would include the existing policies of 2.01.01 through 0.05. Um, I must apologize, we might've had more to report to you, but I ran into some distractions and was unable over the last week and a half to meet with uh, Trustee Barnes, and so we will get back on track, and it's my fault that we didn't get further, I think, uh, but we did feel that we owed the board and the public a status, and that this has not fallen off of our radar, and Trustee Barnes probably has more to add to that. Uh, not too much. Ahead, Thank you, um, Trustee Howard. Um, that's pretty much what I wanted to uh, state, too, that I think we made some good progress in, in mutual understanding of where we need to go in in that um, we want to make sure that there's a separation between a high level policy statement and procedural um, uh, comments so that they're not um, intermingled I, th I think as you said earlier ken there's a sometimes a fine line between a procedure state a policy statement and a procedure and that's what we're trying to um, uh, figure out how we uh, go forward with that so we'll make progress this month well, gentlemen, thank you for that update. And, and Trustee Howard, Ken, I, I understand. I felt like I've had about eight oars in the water lately. So life happens for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, good I, intentions. <laughs> I, I guess I'd like to add, though, that as a result of our discussions, I think our assignment's probably gotten a little bit, um, a little bit larger than I thought it was going to be. Um, so I hope you all have patience with us. But we'll we'll continue to work on it. Certainly, certainly. Appreciate your efforts. All right, anything else, gentlemen? No. Okay, we'll go ahead. Oh, Trustee McKenzie, you have a question? Yeah, may, may I just say yeah. something? Yeah, okay, go ahead, please. Uh, I think I should be afforded um, my assessment of the situations with the president's email that I'm undermining him. And I think it's appropriate in the public especially as the two trustees. So if I talk to each one of them individually, they're making policy and procedures affecting engagement with college personnel, which is what I did. Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. I'm happy to extend the meeting into an executive session if that's what the board would like. So Trustee McKenzie feels that he can be heard. Personnel is never appropriate in open session. I would agree with that, but I, I guess that begs the question, if the conduct policy is going to be created and accompanying procedures created, and then we're going to speak to the conduct policy publicly and approve it publicly and have as an action item with a first reading and a second reading. 
then the contents of the context of that, how do we, and, and again, this is a tough one because how does it get specific about people, although it's really about the president and the five trustees and the interaction and how the trustees interact with the college community. How do we discuss that to establish the conduct board policy or discuss what is created by trustees Howard and Barnes if we can't talk about it openly? It, it's sort of a catch-22. We have situations, call them case studies if you want, and, and those would be examples that people would want to discuss as to how that's then affect what's created and then what's created, you know, what's the ramifications on that? So how do we do that? Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Trustee Howard. Yeah. <clears throat> the way I envision it anyway, this process proceeding is that Trustee Barnes and I are gonna try and spend a, a lot of time um, paying attention to the policy and then hopefully some procedures that help define how the policy should work. Then that will be presented to all of the trustees that they might be able to review it and make recommendations before it ever comes before us for a vote. I mean, this is something that's gonna take some time to refine, but we have to start someplace and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll give you a good starting point for everybody to weigh in on changes or modifications to either policy or procedure. So I would hope that without getting personal about it, we, are, we will be able to establish policies and procedures that address issues that concern all of the trustees. All right. Um, Chair Van Beach, if I could say one more thing. Just a moment, um, certainly. Uh, Trustee Wood, it, did, Christy, did you wanna say something? Sorry, you and Ken were kind of at the same time, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I just, back to my earlier statement on the other policy we were discussing, policy is not built around particular people or particular board members. It's built for the institution. And so I don't want to have a personnel discussion about the president in open session. It's just inappropriate. I would stick around for executive session if that was the de desire of the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trustee McKenzie. Uh, the only thing that I feel is appropriate that I would say in executive session is what I've already said is that a letter came to me saying that I'm undermining the president. Everything else, I would merely state the facts of what actually happened and um, my a short summary of the conversation and let the rest of the trustees uh, say, think whatever they want, if that's appropriate or not. That's all I plan to present. Nothing with regards to or about the president. Mr. Chair. Christy, Mr. Chair, are we done with this conversation now? To be quite frank, I, uh, I'm thinking about that, sir. I'm trying to think what's appropriate. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure everybody has their chance to express themselves and, 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 and have their voice. And yet, what's the appropriate time to cut off discussion? As you and Christy know, when you sit in this chair, sometimes that's that's a challenge because you want to acknowledge and 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 uh, be fair to everybody and and respect everybody's ability to contribute as the five trustees. My my, my challenge is there's been a lot of discussion about communication, and and I guess the question is is that is that topic something that should be talked out in the open and publicly? Or is that something that needs to be sequestered in executive session and, and the topic of, of and honestly, here's my challenge. And I'm just gonna say it. I've had issues, I had issues with the board conduct policy because I thought it stifled communication. I thought it infringed on people's first amendment rights and I was not a, a fan of it. And um, for several reasons. And, um, and so now we're back again with a conversation about communication and and I know you two are working on that and so that's, that's what I'm trying to measure and, and balance this conversation trustee it's, Benji, it's to, yes uh, trustee Barnes if I may circle back around to the topic at hand um, that's exactly please do we're trying to um, address uh, between trustee Howard and myself is to separate um, what is generally a policy which is usually a, a 
changing or, or a non-changing or very rarely changing high level statement versus policies which direct how you carry out those policies because circumstances, environments, uh, uh, people, uh, tools, they change and therefore procedures to meet those policies necessarily do change um, over time and they have to be addressed on a more regular basis. And so that's why we wanted to make a careful assessment of what is the high level statement uh, for the policy and then address under separate procedural documents, how we go about that in our current situation, in our climate, in our culture, uh, the people and, pro and uh, uh, systems that we have in place now. Those have to be addressed um, separately because those things can change um, periodically and should be reviewed uh, uh, time to time, but a policy should stand on its own and be resilient over time. Uh, Mr. Chair? And that is the challenge for it to stand the test of time, clearly. Trustee Wood. And, and I would just like to offer that it is about the time of year that we do a board evaluation. There's plenty of opportunities through our board evaluation to talk about communication. In fact, you're probably going to be looking at scheduling that sometime in April. April or May is generally when we do that. So we have an opportunity to meet and discuss communication. All right. Um, if I may offer one more thought. One more thought, Trustee McKenzie. The conduct policy addressed, at least the prior one, addressed interaction with employees. Well, this is what that was. Trustee Nothing. McKenzie, that's exactly why we rescinded it. Pardon my interruption, but that's why we are addressing it to address the procedural part of meeting the need for a high level policy. All right. I think we need, we'll move on at this time. Uh, unless it, any, anything else, I don't want to cut anybody off. Any, anything else? Okay, good. Um, next on the agenda is uh, the topic for information is spring enrollment. It's Vice President uh, Graydon Stanley. Uh, Graydon, are you ready to present? I think you're on mute, sir. You're right, I was. Thank you for that. Good evening, right. Chairman Banducci, trustees, uh, uh, President McLennan, colleagues and guests as well. I am ready. Are you able to see my PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Great, thank you. Uh, before I start in, I wanted to, uh, President McLennan, would you like to, to offer any remarks relative to enrollment and some of the information uh, coming forward? Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Graydon. So trustees, what, what you're gonna see tonight is uh, some data uh, around enrollment and uh, a couple things that we haven't shown you before. Uh, it's not uh, an analysis of our enrollment. We've, uh, uh, it's well known that our enrollment has been on the decline uh, fairly steadily as uh, several have uh, pointed out tonight. Uh, and we know that uh, that steady decline was markedly interrupted or accelerated with COVID-19. Uh, and uh, because of the length of the decline and the college is interested in serving a, our service area over the last several years, predating me, but certainly since I've been on board, uh, the college has been working in earnest uh, through its strategic plan, through the strategic enrollment management process, uh, many initiatives and activities uh, that are pointed directly at uh, enrollment. Uh, the the HERF uh, funds or CARES funds that uh, Chris briefly talked about, the intent of those funds are uh, to create access and um, uh, to students, access and support for students. And so we're certainly going to see more opportunity with the funding that comes through that. Uh, you'll recall that when the Northwest Commission, uh, both in the exit survey uh, as a result of our full-scale evaluation, and then again in the reaffirmation letter that I received in July, actually accommodated the college on several of the efforts, strategic efforts that have been underway for strategic enrollment management, mentioned uh, our learning commons, Cardinal, Cardinal Learning Central, the library, there are just a number of 
uh, engagement that uh, caught their attention and, and which helped result in, uh, in a commendation. So I, I think for the new board uh, members in particular, as many of the subjects we're gonna be covering, it would be useful at some point uh, in the future to maybe uh, have an opportunity or a workshop to go through some of that, the, some of those activities so the board can uh, have a better and full understanding of the college's efforts and activities around that. It's a long introduction to just say, uh, Graydon, let's do the numbers. Thank you, President McLennan. Again, uh, Chair Van Ducci and, and Trustees President McLennan, I'm glad to provide you with this information. Before I jump into the slide, I wanna uh, certainly pass along some thanks. Information, most of the information that's provided as a part of this report uh, comes from our Office of Planning and Effectiveness. And Chair Van Ducci and, and uh, um, uh, other trustees who have seen this presentation before will note it's quite a bit different and has um, much more detail. So many thanks to Chris Brewer and Lucy Hine, Nashane Noble, uh, Dr. Steve Kurtz, who's on the call tonight, leads that area. And they did a great job of retrieving additional information that we've not presented before that we thought would be of interest to the board. So, so many thanks to them. Um, I also want to note uh, um, incumbent board members know that uh, we have two reporting dates. There's a census date in the fall that's October 15th. In the spring, it's March 15th. And so that's why we wait until this time. Our, our census date, March 15th, just passed. So we're able to compare this information to the same time last year. And that's what you're going to be, be seeing in this report is uh, it's a comparison from spring to spring. Although in later slides, uh, you'll note too, that uh, we give some comparisons to fall semester, just so you have something to compare to within an academic year. So let me start on, on percentage change from last spring, and it's counted in three different ways and wanna make sure you just understand that. So, so head count is literally that, just the number of students taking credit classes at the institution from uh, spring 20 to spring 21, that head count decreased 9.9%. Uh, Total credits, of course, is just uh, all of those students. Some signed up for three, some signed up for 15. And if you total all those together, total number of credits, uh, we decreased 9.8%. And then FTE, I think you probably know, is, is often what we refer to FTE as total credits divided by 15 credits. And that's uh, considered an FTE mark, and that decreased by 9.8%. Uh, the bar graph that you see down below on this slide uh, represents then head count in the, in the blue side and FTE in the gray side. This one, I wanted to be able to show you the mix of, of new and continuing students for spring semester. And again, give you some kind of trend data so you can see how that compares. It's remarkable that you might be anticipating some large changes and, and typically they are not. And you can see that here. Uh, furthest to the left then uh, are continuing students. The majority of those from for spring semester are continuing students, not as many new students obviously coming into the institution. That's not changed much over the last five years. The one next to it, kind of the, the lighter uh, the lighter maroon there is continuing dual, dual credit students who took classes um, compared to the previous spring. So then that has uh, stayed pretty stable. The next one in the light green is new dual credit. So new dual credit students who have never taken dual credit here before. That was down a bit this year and you'll see that reflected in uh, some slides coming up here. And then uh, total uh, enrollment for new students coming in is that 8%. And that was uh, just about stable from last year and over the last several years, a little bit down. That was total new students coming in the spring. And again, uh, probably not a surprise to you that there's not a lot of new students that start in the spring semester. Let me take you to the next one that is enrollment by student type. The student types listed on the top there, academic, those transfer students, dual credit are the ones uh, designated in yellow. Career and technical programs are those in black. Non-degree, those students who are dropping in, just taking some classes, not necessarily after their degree here, want to take some classes and transfer some classes and just pick up specific skills, um, are not eligible to receive financial aid as non-degree students. 
they're represented in that grade. So again, you can see some comparisons from year to year, but as we, we looked at that 9.9% .9 down, this is kind of where it was represented. And I thought we've not presented this before and I thought you'd be interested in that. As we look at academic, you can see that from last spring to this spring, we were down about 7.7% .7 in academic. In the dual credit, a fairly marked increase, or excuse me, decrease there, that we were down about 13.2%. Um, that's obviously impacted by the pandemic environment and what's happened in our, our public schools around this area. Some students homeschooling, uh, just, just uh, it's been a little bit chaotic. We believe that's caused some of that decrease in dual credit. In career and technical, uh, a decrease of about 8.3%. And then in non-degree uh, non seeking, about 16.7%. Overall, that constitutes a 9.9% decrease uh, through all those different student types. This, Great. I know, uh, Chair Banducci, you've asked this question a few times, so I wanted to make sure we were providing this to average credits by student type. And so, um, you have a, a trend there that you can see over the last five years, and you can see a year-over-year -year change from spring 20 to spring 21. Uh, for those academic students, uh, they went from 9.81 average number of credits taken per spring semester to 9.54, about a 2.8% uh, decrease on uh, dual credit, or excuse me, decrease on dual credit. You can see that the number of credits that they're taking increase slightly. There are fewer dual credit students, but they're taking more credits each. So that increased by about 5.6%. Career and technical um, decreased by 2.2%. And then non-degree seeking, those that I talked about just drop in, take a few classes for other purposes than necessarily getting a degree, increased by about 6.9%. You can see those trends are represented a bit in that trend bar. And by the way, if you're having a hard time seeing these uh, Chair Banducci and Trustees, I'm glad to send this PowerPoint out to you afterwards uh, so you can take a look at it if it's difficult to, to uh, see these. This is another area we haven't presented uh, to the board before that I wanted to share this kind of information to you as well. This is in enrollment by division and it shows a, a trend line as well. Important to note that these are headcount numbers and important to note that, um, so they're duplicated. If you added those up, it would be more than the total number of students that we have. But if you look at social and behavioral sciences, for example, and it says 1,489, if a student takes three behavioral science classes all in the same semester, they only count once here. But if a student takes a social and behavioral science class and an English and humanities class and a natural science class, they count one in each division. So students aren't du duplicated within division, but they're counted in each division that they're taking classes for. So I wanted to just make sure you, you understood that. Um, I think most interesting to note, you can see the declines kind of match and, and probably not a, a great surprise to us in a number of these. Um, match our overall decline when you see uh, uh, what the raw numbers are represented in each one. I want to note uh, nursing, it probably doesn't surprise you, you can see is 9.3% up. And then that won't surprise you, I know you've been involved in conversations about aerospace, and of course that was a 40% decline given the direction that we've gone with aerospace. So just uh, showing you how those kind of match up with some of the experience that you're likely familiar with. Full-time and part-time enrollment also wanted to show you that representation as well. So um, the, 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 on the line graph on the top here, the black line represents part-time. You can see that uh, year over year from uh, last to this, there was a 9.6% 9 9 decrease in part-time. In full-time represented by that, that cardinal color line, there was a 10.6% uh, decrease. The, the mix, so that gives you kind of the trend and then the mix is represented down below. You can see that stayed fairly stable. The line graph represents that, the bar graphs do as well, that our mixes stayed pretty close to the same between full-time and part-time. Note that the part-time 
is there's a much larger number of part-time, 65%, about 34%. By the way, full-time and part-time is defined by 12 credits or more is full-time, uh, under 12 is considered part-time. Great. Enrollment by you... age band is an interesting thing to uh, take a look at too here. Um, again, we reported change. You'll note um, of, of, of the big raw numbers, one of the largest uh, decreases uh, was in that um, 19 years of age and under. That would be those dual credit students. That would be students coming directly out of high school. And so that's a fairly sizable um, increase for us. Uh, and you can, and I don't know that we have an explanation. I suspect this is pandemic related to, but two other large decreases uh, by age band came in that 50 to 59 and the, uh, the over 60 group. It's not large raw numbers, but fairly by percentage, fairly um, large decreases in that. I suspect with employment and economic conditions that impacted those age groups. I have tried to, I, we did break this out. I didn't present it tonight by a mix uh, age band combined with part-time and full-time. And I was gonna present that, but there really weren't any large statistical differences that way. The only one was in the 20 to 24 um, age grouping. And there was about 7% um, difference toward part-time in that age group, but the others were very similar. Then this is always interesting to see uh, for dual credit providers. Again, probably not any big surprises to you here though, but the top 10 dual credit high schools for students who are participating in dual credit that we provide. Uh, that top one, uh, the top four course are actually top five or Kootenai County ones. That's probably not a surprise to you. Lake City, Post Falls, Coeur d'Alene, Lakeland, and Coeur d'Alene Charter. Um, again, a bit of a decrease. We talked about overall, there was a large decrease in, in dual credit, and those are represented, of course, in our largest providers as well. When you look at Lake City and, and, and Post Falls and Lakeland there particularly. That's for dual credit. And then top feeder high schools, where do our students uh, come from? And so wanted to to have you see this as well. And again, no surprise, look at the Kootenai County schools there, the top four. One of them that we always talk about is the GED, uh, high school equivalency uh, programs. Now, those are not only students who get a GED from NICR programs, but who come into the school having received a GED from some other, other um, provider of G GED programming. So that's a large one for us. It's our, our fifth largest feeder. You can see homeschool is also a large feeder. You know that there's been growth in the homeschool market. So that's become a large feeder to us as well. And, and lastly, and I thought this was particularly profound to have you take a look at, I wanna explain a little bit of this graph to you because it probably looks a little complicated on that side, but I'll try to walk through this. And then my colleague, Dr. Burns, because this is driven so much, it was, it was driven by the, caused by the pandemic, I guess I should say. Uh, it was driven and responded to by our faculty and by the institution here. How did we deliver courses? And what was the enrollment by modality? We divided that into three modalities, face-to-face, -face, the traditional show up in the classroom, hybrid that involves that combination of some online, some virtual, and then some face-to-face, -face, and then purely online, the three modalities. But what I, what I want to take you to and draw your attention to particularly is um, moving from on the line graph on the left hand side of your screen there, moving from fall 2019 to spring 2020, pre COVID. So that's like at the start of the, the, the semester. So note that our delivery hadn't changed a lot at that time. We were doing a little bit more hybrid, that's the dark line. We were doing about the same as online. And we decreased a little bit in the in the face to face. Uh, there's been a demand for online and hybrid courses, so we were adjusting to that. And then uh, I wanted to show you this change because then in spring 220, that's about the March date when we had to do the flip when uh, uh, the pandemic was declared, when we had to change delivery of our classes. And uh, you know, to to me, it's certainly dramatic, but it's certainly a huge credit to our instructors, to our institution, and to our students to adapt that way. 
when you look at, for example, the red line in face to face and you look at the dramatic decrease in that, when you look at the dramatic increase in uh, online, and then uh, when you look at a, a gradual increase in the uh, hybrid delivery, I think you knew that occurred. I think this illustrates to what degree did it do that. I suspect you wouldn't be surprised either to know that when we moved to fall of 2020, that there were adjustments made still in the pandemic, but knowing the value that face-to-face -face classes have to our students, how much they need them, knowing how much we had learned at the institution about how we can deliver in a, in a uh, safe environment to our students, uh, there were adjustments made again. So you can see that then the online went down. You can see the hybrid that, uh, that provides uh, uh, the experience of both went up. And you can see that the face-to-face uh, went up, knowing that that's what our students need. Moving uh, to spring of 2021, when the environment stayed much the same, there wasn't a lot of dramatic change from fall of 20 to spring of, of 21. The number of hybrid courses went down a little bit. The face-to-face uh, -face stayed about the same. So I wanted to share that, but then I want to take you to the bar graph on the right-hand side because it adds one more element that I think is, is really important for the board and others to, to note. Again, you can, you can see the mix by bar graph and you can see dramatic changes. If you go to the fourth bar down, it shows spring 2020 pre-COVID and you look at what's face-to-face -face compared to hybrid and online. When you go to, that's like January, when you go to March, you see what happens to that mix once we make the, uh, once we make the flip there. We went from 67.9 in face-to-face to 19.9. And then increase dramatically in hybrid, increase dramatically in online. But again, making the adjustment to, to serve our students and our community well, look at what we did in fall. Learned a lot, turned that around, went to, to almost 32% face to face, 35% hybrid, 33% online. Look in spring, we make a little uh, uh, adaptation again. And here's what I think is really significant is look at fall of 2021. We know it hasn't occurred. That's why I couldn't report the, the numbers of students, the headcount for it. But I can report what's planned. We just released our, our class schedule for next fall. You know that our value is to be able to provide education in more of the traditional format face-to-face. -face. So we're working through those protocols, anticipating that we have now almost 60% of our classes almost gone back to pre pandemic levels in terms of face-to-face -face offering. Uh, de decreased our hybrid and uh, have decreased our online so that our mix is different again. We know a lot more than we used to know, so we can do more hybrid, we can do more online effectively, but we know the value to our students and our community of face-to-face. Of -face. So I thought that was uh, pretty profound to, to show that change. And I, before I, I step away from this as the last slide, I wanted to see, uh, Dr. Burns, would you want to add anything to the modality discussion? Chair Benducci, Graydon, thank you for this opportunity. The one thing that I think that I, I would just like to point out is that uh, what we are looking at here is duplicated headcount in terms of the numbers on, on the left-hand side of your screen. So that we just have to keep that in, in mind as you're, you're looking at that. When we look at the course section numbers, I think that that probably portrays a, a more realistic picture of the course offerings to students. And in that, then I would also just like to highlight, Graydon has said, said this a couple of times, but I think it's important to highlight that all of our hybrid sections have a face-to-face -face component. Half of the meeting times of those courses would be face-to-face. -face. So when you look at um, a spring 21, for example, when you see that 34.2, you would really need to add that to a 28.9 for the hybrid to really get a, a more realistic picture of how in person our students were in the spring of, or I should say are, are in the spring of, of 2021. Um, I think that it's an incredible credit. We have to give a, an incredible credit to the faculty who understand our students' needs and really worked hard as we transitioned from that horrible experience last 
March to have to go so dramatically to a distant format and now have really brought the instruction back around to, to meet the students' learning needs. Um, I will give credit in a couple of other uh, places as well because instruction did an incredible job. The faculty were amazing at doing these adaptations, but I have to say we would not have been able to do it without our IT support. The um, technology that we received and, and um, that improved over the summertime and with uh, some of the COVID funds, um, the additional equipment uh, to create Zoom classrooms really helped in the fall, the faculty to um, experience, experiment and experience a different format of offering a hybrid sections. And they found um, that in many cases, uh, using the Zoom format, uh, they were actually able to get much closer to the students in terms of improving communication with students, uh, having uh, conversations and dialogue be more robust in a Zoom environment uh, many times than it, it was even in a face-to-face -face format because students seemed uh, a little more free to talk in the Zoom environment than they would even sometimes face-to-face. -face. And so I think that as Graydon said, we've learned a tremendous amount about what our student learning needs are. People have adapted. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is while this is really related to instruction and the change that was made for instruction, I have to tell you the support that students received from our student services offices have been equally as amazing as what the faculty did. Those, uh, our student support services uh, immediately went to online in uh, multiple modalities, not only Zoom, uh, they all had telephones that came through their computer so they could talk to students anywhere, anytime. And it was that combination of student support, faculty support that I believe really contributed to our success and navigating through this um, really very, very challenging um, COVID time. So thank you for allowing me to share, Braden. Dr. Burns, thank you so much for your comments. I wanted to, to note IT as you did and certainly our student services staff and many others. It was, it was our NIC family who served the rest of our NIC family uh, who are those students and members of our community. So couldn't be more proud of that effort we made in unprecedented times that none of us had any experience in. So very proud of our institution. I would note too, uh, just a couple other things real quickly, uh, Chair Van Ducci. Uh, Trustee Barnes had asked a question, I believe at the last meeting that had to do with, and, and Trustee Barnes, I, I hope that maybe we captured this, although we don't have an answer to it yet. There was a question about of those students who, who uh, went to KTech, how many of them come to uh, NIC? And we went after that. And one of the uh, problems that we had, of course, is we count by high schools. And KTech doesn't count as a high school. It counts of, as this consortium of three high schools. So those students who come here are counted under Lakeland, counted under uh, Post Falls, uh, counted under, under Coeur d'Alene School District. We've gone to, uh, uh, Dean Doyle has gone to the State Department of Career and Technical Education, and they're able to track and we've asked for that information. So we don't have it yet, but uh, Trustee Barnes, if that was what you're after and that's of, of interest, that information we believe will be coming back to us and I'll be able to provide that likely at the next meeting or just under separate cover. Did we, did we capture that question, Trustee Barnes? Wonderful, thank you very much for that clarification. That's, that's good to know, good to understand that. Thank you. The other thing, uh, Chair Benducci, that I'd just like to mention, the president spoke to this for uh, just a minute too, was that as much as, uh, and, and uh, Vice President Martin spoke to it as much as well, we don't want to celebrate, of course, being 9.9% .9 down. None of us like that. Likewise, when we made a projection in fall semester that we were going to be 9% down and we outperformed that, we were only about 3% down, and that's resulted in our, our financial, our, our good financial position for this academic year, uh, it's hard to celebrate being down because we'd like to have increases. Um, I don't want you to think in any way that we've taken our eye off the, the, the prize and the work that needs to be done. The president spoke to some of that. Uh, the Strategic Enrollment Management uh, Council is certainly doing a lot of work and have revised their plan recently has developed a program we're working on now that's about a, a recruitment initiative that is going after students uh, who over the last three to five, five years stopped out, didn't complete their degree or out there and we wanna invite and get them back. Some of them are only three to six credits away and we're working hard to reconnect with them and get them back in to complete their degree. 
the measurement of the success of institutions, at least by our federal government, is often based on completion, degree achievement. And so that's important to our students, but it's important to, to us as well. There's a, a, advising was mentioned and they've done some incredible work. Our, our professional advisors, Jeff Davis and many of his colleagues, and then the faculty working closely together. Uh, we have a comprehensive advising leadership count, uh, council that's really doing some uh, um, great work so that we better serve our students. They need that close advising. There's work that Dr. Pelchat is doing with the FYE program that's really uh, best in class um, kind of work that's gonna impact our students and their retention, particularly over the next uh, you know, five years. I think you'll see in that retention part, some dramatic changes based on the programming that's being done collaboratively between faculty and staff. And so there's just a, a number of, uh, of efforts taking place that uh, we're, we're working with communications and marketing as our partners to get the word out about what we offer and trying to change what some of this picture is associated with enrollment within the environment that we're in. So with, with that, uh, trustees, thank you for allowing me to present that. As I said, I'm really glad to send this along so you can look at the numbers. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to uh, try to answer any of the questions that you might have now. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions for Vice President Stanley from the board? Anyone? Uh, Trustee McKenzie has a question. Chair Banduji, thank you for the opportunity. S student satisfaction survey. Um, as any, any interesting changes with that, with the different modalities? Do, do, they, do students do exit course surveys, satisfaction, feedback? Uh, several several things happen, Chair uh, Van du Duchy, uh, Trustee McKenzie. Several things happen that way. Um, we recently did out of our office. We rec recently did a survey that was on the impacts of the pandemic, and so we got all kinds of responses from them. Uh, surprisingly, um, the the greatest impacts, the top three to four impacts, and I guess not surprisingly, had to do with mental health, isolation lack of social opportunity. Uh, those were like in the top three. The change in instruction was in the middle of the, the bunch of about 25. So it had less impact than we might have imagined would have been, been the case. We had a uh, little over 300 students respond to that survey, which is a pretty good rate for what we get with, with student response. We're certainly looking at, it's been several years that we did a comprehensive student satisfaction survey um, we're certainly looking at bringing one of those back right away. And then there's some work that Dr. Kurtz and, and uh, his office are doing that is through the uh, CCSSE, the Community College Student Survey of Engagement that's being done as we speak that talks about students' experience, particularly in instruction and student services. And so we'll have results from that coming back uh, fairly soon to Trustee McKenzie. So there's work being done that way. It might be premature to say exactly what the impact of the pandemic has been on that, but we have indicators that we'll be able to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Graydon? Uh, Mr. Chair, just to uh, ask Graydon if we could go ahead and follow up and send us that um, the plan that you yes, have. Certainly. That's great. Graydon, very, very comprehensive, very well done. Thank you to you and your staff. Thank you very much. Great, and I do have a couple of questions, uh, not to prolong this, but uh, just a couple of things. Projecting a 3% decrease next fall, is that based on the metrics that you have kind of based on this previous fall that you think it'll be similar? Is, is, is that a... Chair uh, uh, okay. sure, Banducci, it is. In fact, uh, when uh, Vice President Martin talked about that it was the SIM committee that did the work to come up with a projection for enrollment, these were the things that we were studying. Uh, Ken Wardinsky and, and Steve Kurtz and all those folks that have the numbers and the data, and many of us got together and said, based on all this information, it's a little hard to predict our, our future right now, but to the best of our ability and looking at these trends, that's what informed that 3% increase, that, or excuse me, decrease that's planned for fall semester, Chair Van Duty. Great, I'm gonna ask a question and I'm gonna to try to be our, ask it properly here because it could sound not like a great question but 
we seem to have a great working relationship with the folks at KTEC, but it sounded almost like you're saying we have to go through a third party entity to figure out where these where these kids are originating from, what high school. Wouldn't their director, Colby Matia, and their staff know if we gave them a list of names, couldn't they say, okay, that young person came from Post Falls, that person came from Coeur I mean, it seems to me there has got to be an easier way to do this with the folks at KTEC to track where the bodies came from. Am I missing that? Because it's only four high schools, essentially. Well, five with Timberlake. Lakeland 2, Coeur Lane 2, Post Falls 1. I mean, they have the records and they know what high school they came from because they're either in the morning or the afternoon session. Is, is there a reason we can't, or is that a, too much of a burden on them or? No, I don't believe so, Chair Ben Ducci. I think there'll be two different sources of information that we can use, one to confirm the other. One, uh, KTEC can certainly, because of the way that they like to track their students, could certainly share from their perspective of the students who took our classes, this is where we believe they're at. We know that these students went to these institutions. The uh, information that will come from the State uh, Department of Career and Technical Education, as I understand it, is through a, a, a state um, ID system so that they can, they can track and know where these students are at the next year and be able to track that back to the fact that they took CTE classes at KTEC and they are now at NIC. So I think we'll have two different sources of information. and It'll be interesting to try to align those. Here's what the state said, how many of those KTEC students are at NIC. Here's what KTEC said, this is where those students are at. And hopefully those numbers are really close and jive together. So I think we'll get some really good information uh, before long. We had asked for it and just didn't receive it yet, but we can work with KTEC uh, to get their perspective as well. Great. Do we still have the program where if the students are, are full-time students, and I, I believe the threshold was 15, that then they get a credit on the following semester? Do we still have that program in place? Chair Banducci, we don't. That was the three for three for free or 15 defenders. It had a couple different names. We went through that. And, and uh, you know, while it was a great, uh, we felt like it was a great incentive. We didn't have the return on that like we thought. We thought that that might drive credit taking behavior up a bit. And as we tracked those stats and took a look at that, it really didn't have the result that we were hoping for. So we're not continuing that program uh, now. Okay. I noticed the numbers for Boners Ferry High School and Sandpoint High School were fairly high relative to their distance from our campus with the other schools. Is that because of, of the folks at the Sandpoint facility, at the Sandpoint location? That, or are those actually people that, you're, that are driving down here or they come down here from those high schools? So, so as we, if, if you're referring to like the top feeder high schools, Yes, yeah, I'm looking at those numbers. And, and so are those because they're attending NIC, but doing so in Sandpoint? Or are those people, well, I guess I wouldn't even say physically now, could be online, could be hybrid, could be physically here at our main campus. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what that number means to me. And, and or, or is that just because we have that facility up there and we're getting the, a lot more bodies up there because we have something in Sandpoint? I'm, I'm certain, uh, Chair Banducci, that having the facility and the representation of the college in the county there has that serves both of those counties um, has some impact on this. These numbers that you're seeing are without regard to where they're attending NIC. So this many came from Bonners Ferry, Bonners Ferry, this many came from Sandpoint, and they may be attending here on campus or they may be attending in the outreach center. So it's without regard for where they're attending uh, once they've matriculated to NIC. Okay. Um, on the face-to-face, -face, uh, looking at those numbers, and, and I know we're increasing those, hopefully. Um, we certainly did in the fall, uh, spring, a little bit of a draw. As, at this time, and as we continue to open up in the fall, but for currently, this past fall and this spring, are the bulk of those in our career and technical education because of the need for how, how the instruction is delivered? Because it just doesn't lend itself to necessarily to the online or the hybrid. So like at the Parker Technical Center and our nursing program, where those folks really need to be more in person. Is sure, that what we're seeing? You, that? I, I think you're right in, in your assumption, but I'm gonna ask my colleague, Dr. Byrne, I'd love to see your picture come on, Lita, to, to respond to that as well, please. Chair Banducci, I would tell you that across the board, across all courses, these um, numbers represent um, are face-to-face -face across the board. You are correct that 
a lot of our programs um, in career and technical education that do have that hands-on. And so absolutely need to be face-to-face. -face. But I um, also need to share that um, even the programs out at Parker um, and many of our nursing and health professions programs, certainly our business career tech education programs, maintained the theory portion of their um, instruction in an online format and only um, use the labs for the face-to-face. -face. And so it really is a balance. What you, you would think that that really was mostly um, the career and technical education. Those numbers are, are more reflective of what happened across campus in all general oh. education and career and technical education. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question, and, re and really this is for Dr. Burns and Dr. Stanley. Once upon a time, I handed you guys a portfolio that someone very special to me was working on as they were working towards their degree at LCSC. And it was a way that LCSC had these people build basically a, a life portfolio for life skills and credit for their employment history and all the rest of that. And, and you could get a number of credits for that time spent in their life. And this was maybe for more mature students and then use those credits towards their degree. Um, I know you both have had a chance to look at that. Is that something that we will be able to, to use or model off of to, to try to get some more folks coming here? Is that something we could use to try to give them a, a boost with some of their credits and things? Chair, Chair Benducci, thank you for, for having shared that with us because I know that was, that was precious to you as well. That's about uh, prior learning and I'd love to have doc, Dr. Burns, I know has been involved in those discussions extensively. Chair Benducci. Uh we continue, I would say, not only as a college, but as a state, try to refine our credit for prior learning policies and how we approach students. Um, the state does have a policy on credit for prior learning. Um, it doesn't currently include um, the portfolio as, as you had shared with, with us, but there is consideration for some of those life experiences. I think that as we get more into um, a acceptance of how experience and particularly um, short-term educational experiences that you know sometimes now are called badges or, or things like that, as we incorporate those more into how those can be stacked in order to receive credit, I think we will see actually more, much more use of the portfolio that, um, the, uh, of things like the portfolio that you shared with us. Um, it's interesting to me that I, you know, that was the experience that LCSC was using at one time. I'm not sure they're even currently using that portfolio experience as, as um, people in your, your life had, had used it in the past. So, um, but certainly it's a part of the consideration for evaluating um, prior learning experiences for credit. We're just not there yet, but it's, we talk about it often, we're working towards it. I hope that someday before I retire, we actually have that uh, in place. Thank you. And, and I'm not trying to be secretive for, for those that are wondering what's up. It was my mother's portfolio and my mother passed in 2012. So to lead us point, there has some time has passed since she was actively engaged in that and trying to continue to pursue her, her degree later in life. And uh, unfortunately she was not able to finish it before. And then anyway, cancer got her and that was the end of that game. So, but I appreciate you guys looking and, and uh, if there's any value there, if you've been able to glean anything out of it, that's great. I know she'd be pleased. Um, all right, are there any other questions on this topic of the spring enrollment by any of the other trustees? All right, not hearing any, uh, we'll move on to the athletics update and uh, Graydon, you're up again. Thank you, Chair Banducci, uh, trustees, President McLennan, colleagues and guests. Thanks uh, for the opportunity to give you an update on our athletic department. Our athletic director, Bobby Lee, is with us tonight. I'm going to ask him to share some more specifics with you in just a moment. But I, I want to uh, uh, remind you about a discussion we had in December about the status of our athletic program. And at that time, I shared with you some principles and some processes that uh, we had asked our athletic department, our student athletes and coaches to follow. Um, much of that was dictated by our conference, by the NWAC. You might recall us talking about the phases, the color phases that we had to work through these two-week sets. And uh, 
not have setbacks and follow certain kind of protocol. We had a local protocol here in our county and in our state. We had our institutional protocol. And uh, I am just so proud of, uh, of Bobby and his staff, of our coaches, and particularly our student athletes who have uh, stayed with us, followed the protocol. And it's had the reward in the end. I think all of you know, and Bobby will share out a little bit more about that. But uh, we have been competing the wrestling team early on. And uh, then our other teams you're going to see are going to be competing really soon. But uh, Bobby can tell you that it's been through a lot of hard work uh, of our coaches, of his staff, of our, our student athletes. And I'm just so proud of what they've done and uh, those people uh, that have supported them. So um, Bobby, I'd love for you to jump in and share kind of more of the details about uh, where we've been and where we're at, where we're going. Um, Bobby Lee. Why not? Sure. Thank you, Graydon. Uh, appreciate that. Chair Benducci, fellow Board of Trustees members, President McLennan, uh, spring sports are going. Uh, the one we started with is, is our wrestling team. We started in February. Uh, we've had four different opportunities on campus to host outside competitions in the latest one. Uh, on the 13th of February, uh, we dueled against the number one team in the nation, the number two team in the nation, and a, and a third one who was receiving votes. Uh, uh, in that one, we beat the number two team in the nation, which was awesome. We continue, continue to see the progression of our wrestling program. Uh, and, and right now, they are in process in planning to go to the nationals in Council Bluff, Iowa, uh, April 20th and 21st, 20th through 21st. So they're making continual progress. That, that group of freshmen is really doing some good stuff. Uh, of our NWAC sports, our eight other sports, um, uh, we work with the state of Oregon and the state of Washington, as well as parts of British Columbia to that have participating teams. Uh, we started playing women's soccer last Wednesday. Uh, we play men's soccer and basketball this coming Friday uh, in scrimmages. So our teams are making progress and we will play through uh, the weekend of finals week tentatively right now in home and away contests for women's soccer. We have 12 set up. Women's basketball, we have six. Volleyball, 10. Softball, 15. Men's soccer, 13. Basketball, 10. Golf is four, but they play on multiple days, and wrestling was multiple options. So, and those are just the tentative schedules. Our coaches are working with other, other institutions and other programs to see if we can get some additional uh, contests. Uh, in the process, uh, our safety protocols that we've had in place that we followed on a daily basis. We call it our healthy roster. It happens every day. Uh, our student athletes get a text message. They fill it out on their phone related to symptoms. Uh, they get a check mark back. And as they come to practice, they show the coach their check mark for the day and the date is reported. We check their temperature and then they come into practice. Uh, since we've returned in January, uh, we've done uh, weekly saliva testing with our student athletes. Um, we started that, I want to say, in the second week of January. We've tested all of our student athletes and all of our teams multiple times. Uh, and in that time, I, I think our students have done such an amazing job of staying together in their quote unquote bubble of team that has been absolutely awesome. I mean, they've, they, they, haven't, they haven't went outside that bubble. And, and in those test results, we've had one assistant coach uh, test positive and a student athlete that had had COVID previously. So in all the tests in which we've done, and we've done hundreds and 500s, and we've done a lot of them, and it's been really good. The state of Idaho has provided that testing to us. Uh, our home event protocols are in place. Uh, they come from the NWAC. They come from the local health authority and North Idaho College. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we can't have spectators to our outside events. It's based on capacity. Uh, we, can, we do not have... Uh, spectators on indoor uh, activities just yet. I, I think that could be changing. Um, there's, there's some continual protocols that are adjusting in the, in the NWAC conference keeps us informed. Uh, we're live streaming all of our home events. Uh, our IT department has been absolutely awesome helping us through that process. Uh, so yeah, they just, the joy and excitement of our coaches, the joy and excitement of our student athletes, getting a chance to participate, getting their, their just getting the, the opportunity to do what they also, they came here to come to go to school, but also they came here to participate in athletics. So 
we've had a plan. We've had the opportunity to follow that plan. And our student athletes and teams are so darn excited to have the chance to compete. So NIC Athletics is getting after it, and we're really fortunate for that. I'll take any questions if they have them. Or do, does anybody have questions for uh, Bobby or for Graydon? Mr. Chair? Yes, Trustee Wood. Yeah, for Bobby. Bobby, this is this will be the first year you finally get to utilize Memorial Field. You must you be kind so of right. Yep. <laughs> we thought we'd be there two years ago. Um, have you had a chance to check out the new facility? I mean, it's a, a restroom, locker room facility, but uh, have you been able to look at it? Uh, I went back and forth with Bill just a little bit. Yes, we've we've been in that discussion, and as we prepare the the facility for our team taking over and having contests, yeah. The city has been awesome. The facility is going to be great for our student athletes. That's great. Well, I want you to know, I have not stopped my mission of getting a big cardinal on the side of the, uh, the memorial grandstands. I think it's coming. I yep. think we're close. That's still um, in process. You're right. Yeah. So, well, congratulations to you for all your hard work and your coaches. Everything that you have done to keep our athletes safe, keep them playing, means a lot to them. And um, it's been a terrible year. Nobody wanted to interrupt their careers, but you guys have been exceptional in trying to help them every way you can. Thank you very much. It's our coaches, it's our staff and our students. Any other trustees with questions? Chair Van do you have a question? Uh, Trustee McKenzie. It looked like EDWAC and NJCAA were separated in your Word document at the top. And it said NWAC is allowed to travel starting in April. And NJCAA, are they, is, is, that would only be our wrestling. Are they permitted to travel? Yes, both teams are permitted to travel. Yep, it just, it took a while for the NWAC schedule to get put in place. Uh, North Idaho College is a semester school. All the other schools in which we participate in or participate with are quarter schools. And the end of March is the end of their winter quarter. So they start spring quarter, April 5th. And so their administration kind of used that as kind of their tool on what they were doing. So yes, both of our, all of our programs have the ability to travel. So. Okay. Is, so if, but that's only starting April. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. And all right. And the NJ's see there's a big conference and that's April 20th, right? The, their national tournament is April 20th through 20, 22nd, I believe. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Chair, Chair Banducci. Yes. Go ahead. I want to add, and I think it's to uh, Trustee McKenzie's uh, questioning too. Um, I think as you, you as, as Bobby noted, we hosted a number of wrestling tournaments here. And in fact, the reason that we were hosting and those were Oregon uh, and Washington schools was because we could here. The state of Oregon and the state of Washington was not allowing them to have indoor events like that at all. So um, those schools, Clackamas, um, um, Umqua, uh, Swak, those schools were very anxious to wrestle as were we and were very glad to travel here because we had the ability following our protocol. We, we required testing of all those teams when they came here. And so they tested prior to coming. They followed our protocol and they were so thrilled to have a place to wrestle. And NIC was the host of those and we managed the events according to all of our protocol. Is that in... Chair Bandu, go ahead. Uh, is when say Oregon or those schools that you listed when they came here was that an overnight travel? Uh, Chair Banducci and Trustee McKenzie, it was overnight travel for them to do that. We didn't we didn't really have a place to travel at the time because we couldn't go to Oregon and Washington for those. So we were very glad to host here. Plus, it gave us the opportunity to control the environment that our athletes were. Uh, we're participating in, and I think resulted in the kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, great safety that Bobby was uh, speaking to. Uh, I'll ask one more question. As NIC, like if, 
permitted our athletics teams to travel overnight to other institutions. Like since we started practicing, I think, um, has that been, what, what's the decision on that? Uh, no, um, Chair Banducci, Trustee McKenzie, we're not competing with, with any of those other teams. Wrestling didn't, didn't uh, go any other place at all. We hosted all of, all our other teams. They don't start competing until uh, early April, mid-April. They will be traveling. None of them are traveling and staying overnight. We're required to participate within our regions too. That's what the NWAC, we stay, instead of traveling east, west, north, and south, we compete in our east region. I think, and Bobby, you'd have to correct me on that, but I think all but one of those institutions is day travel anyway. We're able to go over, play, and come back. The only one that isn't is Treasure Valley Community College in Ontario. We looked at neutral ground in between. We're able to find that. And so uh, we're not competing overnight at Treasure Valley. So we will not be staying overnight, but we have a two to three week season is essentially all we're competing in because from when we start to when our semester ends. Thank you. Um, do any other board members have questions? If I have one more question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm sorry to talk so much, no, you're, me, but student you're safety fine. is is important, and I'll delay us all for that. Um, masking and protocol is, you know, safety for COVID. Take it serious too, but there is no silver bullet in life. If you put on a mask, then it's harder to do other things. And has there been any? athlete student safety incidents related to mass. Uh, Bobby, would you like to respond yeah. to that? Yes. Trustee McKenzie, we, we have not had, we, we've done a really good job with our athletic training staff, as well as our coaches of talking with our student athletes that if they get to, especially in a strength and conditioning or a, or a cardiovascular part of it, if they get to a stage where it's a difficult to, to back off and, and not go as hard. So we have not had, we had one young lady we had an incident with uh, in the spin room, but it was, I, I think it was some sickness as well as the mass part of it. But, but since then we've, we've worked around a schedule and created a pattern for her to be successful. So uh, more often than not, no, we haven't had any. I do have a couple of questions. Actually, I had a lot more, but it's getting late. So I have a couple quick ones. I know we'll just say at the 10,000 foot view, I'm not going to throw stones, but I'm, I'm disappointed in the NWAC's approach. I, I watched people wrestle in the fall and my son's alma mater wrestled and hosted tournaments. I just watched the NCAA D, D1 national championships because we had a young man from Post Falls that was the five seed at 149. And unfortunately he went one and two and, and, and didn't place, but you know, watching a local young man there and there were, I think others from the Northwest and, they're doing it. There's fans in the stands. We just watched the NBA and there's fans in the stand or not NBA, but the, uh, well, NBA is doing it, but you got the uh, NCAAs and we're saying no spectators at all inside. And that's very disappointing. Not even parents. And I guess that almost lends me to wonder, we're saying we can have spectators outside, but if I'm sitting in the bleachers at the gymnasium watching basketball and I'm socially distanced, what's the difference between being at Memorial Field sitting in the bleachers and being socially distanced? And are we going to have spectators at Memorial Field? What's the definition of an outside sport? I mean, golf is definitely outside. Soccer, depending on where you stand and how everybody clusters, because there's well, really only the ones, the two sides where they, people stand in bleachers. So what's going to be the definition of outside and what are we going to be allowed for spectators for these different sports? I'm kind of curious. And NWAC's been, because it's Oregon and Washington, has been way out there compared to most of the rest of the country. And, and it, is it NIC's policy or, or, or is it NWAC all the way on this? Or, or are we abridging that policy a little bit? Chair, Chair Banducci, I'll take the first stab at that. Bobby can add to it if he, he would like. We follow NWAC policy for all of those programs. So that's what we're following right now. But that is changing week to week. It's changing based on the conditions in Oregon and Washington, which is obviously where the largest number of those schools come from. So when you're speaking to the idea about having spectators in the gym, you know, they, they, they are now allowing that in Washington is what I understand. They're not yet in Oregon, but there's some consideration. 
by the time we actually start competing, uh, Bobby and I have watched, we get a weekly update uh, from the NWAC and things are changing uh, quickly. So I wouldn't be surprised that by the time we actually get the competition, there could be new guidance coming from the NWAC that would, like the NCAA that you mentioned, that would allow a limited number of spectators following protocol like we see in the, the, the March Madness games now. I wouldn't be surprised if we, we have the opportunity to move to that by the time we start competing. Bobby, did, would you add to that? Yeah, they're just following the protocols of how, the, the amount that things have changed since, since this has went through, I definitely can see that happening. Okay. I'm concerned financially for our teams and how this is gonna affect with the way the, the eligibility is working and for them to be able to recruit and to give scholarships. Um, most of them lost all their camps last summer. Don't know the status if they're going to have any camps this summer. Wrestling lost Tri-State, which is probably their, one of their biggest fundraisers. And, um, you know, the foundation has been rebooted, but it, it gets really overshadowed by the foundation. The foundation really takes up all the oxygen, and I don't even see the Booster Club actively fundraising right now. So I'm, I'm concerned of how we're going to provide money. And then I, also, I see we lose a couple assistant coaches, Girls basketball lost one, women's basketball, excuse me, wrestling lost one. Um, I don't know if that, you know, if that's a financial impact. And then I, I, I see all these other things. I'm concerned about where we're at in budgets. And then I've got three women's sports, if I'm correct, that have interim tags by their head coaches. And I'm wondering how many ladies are on the women's basketball team right now. I heard we'd have a hard time even fielding a team. And that maybe a couple of people were offered that position and didn't accept it. And I've talked to local high schools, just talked to the Coeur d'Alene coaches. They got at least one gal committed to Blue Mountain. Another one's thinking it. A couple of them have been talked to by other NWAC colleges. They got one gal that one of the coaches told me would be perfect for NIC, but we're MIA. We've had no, no NIC coaches talk to their players. So I'm wondering, first off, I'm concerned about women's athletics and the stability of those athletics and how many we have to participate. I'm concerned about our funding for our programs help me guys and then and then you know camps uh, wrestling can't have a camp kids can't wear a mask you you put a mask on a wrestler it lasts about six seconds the first thing you do is you rub on each other and kids don't want to wear masks i mean in the paper the other day and i don't know if anybody can see this but here's the pictures of all the sports teams there's the wrestling team there's post falls with team real life for all the kids there's the wrestlers there's the bowlers there's not a single mask on one person there's gymnasts there's the soccer I got two whole pages of all the kids. No kids coming to a camp and wearing a mask. Not the young kids anyway. So I don't, I don't see how we have camps and how we raise the money. So where are we going with our athletic program, guys? I, I feel like we're, we're, what are we doing for our coaches and our athletes and, and the opportunities and the funding and, and the stability? And, and the women's athletics in particular, even just from a Title IX standpoint, you know, where are we at with the number of athletes to be able to field teams? And great. And I'm going to direct that right to you because, you know, you direct Bobby. So absolutely. Talk to me. Absolutely. Chair Van Ducci. I'm glad to do that. And Bobby can fill in the gaps. I would love for you to, to have conversation with some of our coaches and get their perspectives on this as well, because while I know they're concerned about what's occurred in this pandemic, they've been most concerned about taking care of their student athletes this year. But in terms of the recruitment for next year, you brought up women's basketball and I think Bobby can, can confirm. I think we've got at least 12 signed for next year. Our roster this year is small this spring for a number of reasons, many of those personal and related to, to student athletes, some personal related to the, the head coach as well. Uh, but as far as recruiting for the future, if you talk to Corey about uh, who he's recruited, if you talk to Mike about who and how he's recruited, if you talk to Kelsey Parson about how she's recruited, I'm not concerned about the amount of support in terms of grant and aid uh, scholarship for, for our athletes. And I think our coaches have within what had to initially be a virtual environment is no longer. We have student athletes who have been visiting our campus prospects for the last uh, month, six weeks, something like that. I think our coaches are doing a great job and are being really aggressive about filling their rosters that way. I'm not concerned to that end. To the hiring end, uh, we went through processes where we had some failed searches. Not that we didn't have good candidates, but at the end, uh, with with salary, with whatever reasons, we weren't able to fill a couple of those. 
we have coaches in interim positions. We've talked to HR, we're going through the process, processes to fill those on a permanent basis that way. In terms of ratios of coaches and support for men and women, you're right about your reference to Title IX. As you know, we did a Title IX study, Chair Van Ducci, a couple of years ago, and we were in compliance and we'll continue to do that in the support that we provide for our men and women that way. So um, as much as it's certainly been a difficult uh, environment, Chair Van Ducci, I know you have a strong interest in and a concern for our student athletes. We did this year as well. I'm really hopeful, I'm really optimistic, and I'm really proud of Bobby and our coaches for what they've done this year to maintain what we did. Their planning for the future, I think, is solid. I would think, I think they'd tell you they're on good ground. Let me go to budget for just a half a second. Institutionally, we fund our athletic program really well through, through our funds. Our booster club, as you know, used to raise a lot of money and programs raised quite a bit of money. Bobby's worked really hard the last six months in the transformation of our, of our booster club and some of the work that, that they've done. Um, they have a golf tournament scheduled. They have other events that they're bringing back that we can now do in our environment. They have a new membership. If you go to a, a booster club meeting and look at uh, who the leadership is and the people that are involved, we're actually really optimistic and really encouraged about all of these new fans who are also following our program. Uh, we've had conversations, Bobby and I, recently about Tri-State for this next year. If the environment allows, it's certainly something we want to do to help support that program. We're going to do that within the context of the principles that we outlined for safety. Um, I would never apologize for the support that we're trying to provide to our coaches and our student athletes. Bobby, would you like to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Greg. Chair Banducci, uh... I'm in constant communication with our coaching staff and with our student athletes on a daily basis. And the biggest principle that I continue to talk with them about, we want to do the best we can for our student athletes. We want North Idaho College to win nine championships a year. And that's the direction we go each and every day trying to create that. It, it has been an unbelievably unique time, but I'm in constant conversations with our student athletes as well as our coaches. And I really believe we're going in the right direction. We're doing as best we can, and it will continue to get better. Well, my understanding is that none of the CARES money can be spent on athletics. And with the loss of the fundraising, I guess I'm just concerned about having adequate funds. And again, I'm not a fan of losing assistant coaches. I think there's a safety issue there. I think wrestling needs a minimum of three. And I think every team needs two, you know, for all sorts of reasons. And so even the women's basketball, if they, I, and I'm not sure, I, I, I'm not sure it, it's going to, when we get back to normal, trying to share one of the men's assistant, the men's assistant coach with the women is, is, is an ideal situation. I'll just say that. And then you mentioned booster club meetings. Are we having booster club meetings? Because I've attended a lot of booster club meetings over the eight years I've been a trustee. Well, seven, because we really didn't have any of this last year. And certainly a number of them at the Outback, but some at the Coeur d'Alene Resort and others. If we're having those meetings, I'd sure like to know about it because I'm not aware of it. And I didn't even know we were playing this weekend until today. So I would have liked us to shout that from the mountaintop because I think that's a big deal. Bobby, would you uh, like Bobby, to go ahead, please. Yeah, Chair Banducci, uh, the, the booster club meetings in which we had are via Zoom and they're the advisory board. We have not had a booster club luncheon. No, we have not. We haven't had the ability mm -hmm. to to gather in a place and share our student athletes and share our, our coaches and stuff like that. No, sir, we haven't done that yet. That's in okay, the plan, that's in the works. And I can't wait for the opportunity to have a chance to do that. No, that's great. I mean, I just would have hated to, to miss being able to support that. Uh, yeah, Chair Banducci. Yes, uh, okay. President McLennan, yes. Right. So there's still uh, some clarity, I should say, being developed around the higher education recovery funds. Uh, your reference to those funds being used for athletics has specifically to do deal with, I think it's one of the one of the few things, well, there's a several guardrails around this, and some of them we've already pointed out. But one thing that is a uh, prohibition is spending the funds on building athletic facilities. I don't believe we have the proper guidance yet to know that we cannot use HERF funds to recover lost revenue for athletics. Um, whether we can or we cannot, uh, the institution is committed to continuing to support athletics uh, in, in, in a big way, in a much bigger way than uh, 
at least the, the other colleges in the NWAC are able to support their uh, athletic department. So, Chris, did I get that right on the HERF funds? Yes, sir. So for a fundraiser, if there's a lost revenue uh, around that, and we can make a credible case for that lost revenue and document it, um, it's entirely possible. Again, we're still waiting for some more solid guidelines on some of these questions, but that's not something that's been uh, taken off the table at this point. Thank you for the additional information. The little I had heard, maybe it wasn't to be able to be used for athletics, but that's new, that's new information to me. So thank you. Okay. I'd been kind of following to see where the money could go. And I didn't know if we could go there or not. Do we, well, I guess we'll see when we get that. Who would give us that clarification? Rick? The U.S. Department so, of Education. Well, yeah. <laughs> and what we've learned uh, from our prior experience is that we can get clarification and then it can become murky again. And then we get clarification and the rules get applied backwards. So uh, we're being very careful. Let me just put it that way. Fair enough. It's working with the government. I understand. All right, gentlemen, thank you. Are there any other questions? All right. Thank you. It's the late hour. It's the board chair report. All I'll say is I'm excited to see what our Meyer Health Center building looks like in a year and change. And uh, I'm excited to see those programs expand and, and uh, how many nurses can we get through there to help all of us as we're aging? Because we need them. On that note, are there any remarks for the good of the order? Anybody? Christy's still working on the big cardinal, okay, for the bleachers. Uh, Trustee McKenzie uh, has one. Uh, I have some requests, um, but I'd like to just say something before is um, I'm gonna make these following requests and I feel if I do anything as a trustee, then I get unfair criticism and interference with no specific supply by trustee Woods. I am not afforded the opportunity to even explain myself when it comes from the president and yet the president is allowed to claim that newly elected officials are elected to take him and this university down. We are not a rubber stamp or figurehead symbolic face of the college. We are fiduciary overseas and can only uphold our responsibilities when operational executive openly and effectively communicates and follows the policy this board establishes. So my requests are this. Um, I am unhappy with the current way the board emails uh, are coming to each one of us. And uh, I want the uh, board conversation of um, changing the board email to a distribution list so we all get it. And, um, and then we can receive a copy automatically and it's less work for staff employees. And then when the staff, sometimes there's inappropriate things emailed to the board, um, such as student issues, then um, staff can uh, claim those emails and naturally we can ignore those. Um, is there any trustees that oppose my request? I don't. I, I, I... I will make one comment on that. And maybe this is something we can talk offline. Maybe Rick, this is something you and I can talk about. I'd like to rethink how we use that drop box. Um, I have a tendency to, to think I'm not seeing everything or I'm not navigating that drop box correctly and, and what's coming in and what's going out. So maybe that's something we can talk about. Uh, maybe just a little change in process or procedure there. Uh, I don't know if that's really a remark for the good of the order, but uh, we'll, we'll go with that. Can I make more requests? Uh, Mr. Chair, these are Trustee more, these are more yeah. agenda items I'm happy to chat about on an agenda, but for good of the order, you're asking for decision making, and I don't really even understand the proposal, so maybe it could come forward on a future agenda. Yeah, I mean, we could do that. Um, I have a proposal for a future agenda item, then Christy, you can weigh in. I would like an accreditation agenda item, maybe 101, so we can talk about at the next board meeting. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. All right. Are there any other uh, remarks for the good of the order? Uh, I'm also interested in a workforce development center tour. Uh, no, that is a positive thing. Workforce set, uh, say that again. Workforce development center tour. I've, um, I've got an idea and uh, I would, I'm interested in a, in a tour of the workforce development center. Trust uh, um, President McLennan. Is that something that you could please facilitate for Trustee McKenzie, and then maybe 
see if anybody else would like to do that with him. If it could sure, and, and, and I will. Uh, I'll see that tour and raise it to a tour of any of our facilities uh, throughout the district. Um, we have the center up in Sandpoint uh, for sure. We have the uh, Workforce Development Center in Post Falls. Uh, the pandemic has kind of made things a little bit tricky about organizing uh, gatherings. Uh, Trustee McKenzie, you know that we were able to accommodate uh, your request to take you through the Headland Building uh, and Gizmo. Um, I know that the folks out at Parker are particularly interested in getting the trustees, the new trustees who haven't had a chance to get through there uh, to see what, a, what an, incredi an incredible and amazing facility that, that is. So we will certainly uh, make that opportunity available to you and really, uh, a campus tour might be uh, good as well to see what, what's actually uh, on the main campus uh, for North Idaho College. Uh, some of the things are uh, our medical sim simulation lab. I mean, we have some uh, really, uh, some of the labs that uh, Renee talked about in her presentation are um, second to none, whether it's a university or a community college. And uh, I'd be very pleased to uh, show those to you. I would be interested in an aerospace building tour as well. I know last time I toured, um, I did get um, critique as well on the last time I toured the aerospace um, building. But uh, the last time I toured there, there was lots of heavy equipment there. Um, I'd be interested in uh, kind of seeing the aerospace tour and how the wind down go. Well, it sounds like the invitation has been thrown out to all of us trustees. Um, if anything, May I make a request, uh, uh, Rick, of you? If we do set up any tours, if it's available, maybe you could let, if a trustee sets up a tour, maybe you could let the other trustees know that it's occurred. And if anybody could join in that, maybe, you know, get more than one person at one time uh, to, to do that. Um, just be, maybe be a little more efficient with it if it work, should work out that way. And then also for uh, Trustee Barnes, when he gets back in town, he may want to, participate in that too, um, it's, uh, with some of that. Um, all right, uh, anything else for the good of the order from anyone? All right, it's a late hour. I wish everybody, uh, 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 nobody's really traveling, I guess just us. I was gonna say a good evening and safe travel and uh, we will uh, adjourn this meeting. Take care. Thank you, good night. Good night.